Hey folks, welcome back to Indaba Africa. This is Chris coming to you live from central Pennsylvania. Well, I'm kind of excited about today's guest. It's been quite a busy weekend for, here, for those of you following the channel here at Chris Wide Africa. Let's see, we had hind marks from uh, the ULA, United Liberty Alliance, the uh, secessionist independence movement on Friday for the Western Cape or the Cape, I should say. And then on Saturday, Dr. Corne Mulder. But before that, I was up at three o'clock in the morning for those who know. So I started streaming four o'clock in the morning for the Bikers Against Farm Murders and Racism and was involved with that all day. And then we had Dr. Corne Mulder from the Freedom Front Plus on. And today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my first Springbok interview, a former Springbok number six, well, never former, you always got that number, but Springbok number 636, Andre Sneeman, who's currently living in the UK. I know a lot of my viewers have been saying, hey, where, because I mentioned I was trying to get him. Hey, where's he at? What's he up to? I haven't heard about him lately. Well, here's your chance, ladies and gentlemen, to hear about Andre Sneeman. So I'm going to bring Andre in right now. Here we go. Andre, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Chris. Let me do a real quick thing, because sometimes the sound with Zoom kind of kind of lets me down here, Andre. I want to make sure I can hear it on uh, mobile very quickly and see how it sounds, because uh, you don't, you don't want technical difficulties, but welcome into the stream. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for having me on the show, Chris. I really appreciate it. Now, it's awesome. You know, when I mentioned that I was going to reach out to you because I'd known you from LinkedIn, uh, my audience uh, was like, seriously? Yeah, get them on the channel, man. Get them on the channel. <laughs> and then what, the, what they don't know is that scheduling is a challenge. Um, you had events going on as well as you had a holiday uh, taking place. And yeah. uh, I wasn't sure if we we're going to be able to pull it off for a little bit there, but, but it worked out and here you are. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Like I say, I mean, unfortunately, scheduling is sometimes a, a nightmare and the logistics around thing and uh, being uh, a rugby coach and in holiday time and having two kids and keeping them busy during the holidays and a lot of other commitments. But I mean, I'm, I'm always uh, open for these kind of uh, webinars and, and Zoom meetings, which is it's great because you're always doing some great network and uh, just to share my experience with people. It's brilliant. I absolutely love it. And just sometimes just to sit back and listen to what other people's got to say is also great sometimes. Oh, absolutely. One of the nice side benefits of all this for me has been that uh, uh, because sound sounds good on my end. Sorry about this. I just want to make sure one of the side benefits for me is that uh, with all the interesting guests that I have on my channel, uh, I actually get to uh, expand my horizons a bit, too. I mean, I've had a former panel beater from Pretoria on here who decided to become an artist. <laughs> He's a Tswana speaker, and and he decided he wanted to be an artist. And, you know, he did panel beating yeah. for 17 years, and he said, to heck "Wow!" With this. And uh, he started a couple years ago, and it was a struggle. You know, he had to get going, but then he started making money, and then COVID hit. So, but uh, yeah, so quite a quite a number of interesting guests. Well, Andre, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up in South Africa. Well, so first of all, I mean, I grew up in um, a little small town called Danauza. It's in the northern Natal region, which is about three and a half hours inland from Durban, which is on the East Coast. Um, so it's a very, very small little town. Um, that's where I grew up. My dad or my family used to be farmers uh, in the community. Um, so when went to Dundee High School, um, matriculated in, uh, or graduated in 1992. Um, and then I decided to go to Pretoria uh, to go and study engineering. Went there to study uh, engineering, um, finished the, the engineering. And then while I was studying, obviously started playing for the Blue Bulls, um, played in the, the local league, so to speak. And then the selectors for me, picked me up um, or earmarked me, went into the Blue Bull. The, in those days, it was called the old Northern Transvaal uh, training camps and everything. And then in 1994, I started playing for the Blue Bulls. Uh, had a really good run with them until end of 99 um, and then I decided it's time to go back home which is Natal um, so I managed to get a contract with the Sharks Natal Sharks uh, went to Durban uh, I played for them until the end of 2003 and then that's when I decided to move to the UK to uh, a club called Leeds Tykes mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, in the north of England in Yorkshire or West Yorkshire uh, played for them um, at, from the end of 2003 until May of 2007, and uh, and that's when I retired. So I just retired in 2007, and then obviously with within that I started playing for the Springboks in 1996, and then my last game for the Springboks was also in uh, 2007, 2006. Sorry. So I had a 10-year career playing for the Springboks and then uh, a 15-year career 
playing club rugby, profesh, semi-professional, professional, until I retired. Well, that's uh, that's quite a roundup of the career there. I was going to ask that over a spread of time, but we can talk about each of the things. But one of the uh, one of my viewers, who's also a moderator here, uh, grew up in Katanga, in the Congo, uh, and then her family was able to get out the last minute during the, the nonsense taking place there. They were they knew Moise Shombe, who was the breakaway uh, president of, of the of the Katanga Secession Movement, but but she's lived all over Southern Africa, and she mentions that she used to live in Donhauser. Look at that, yeah, small world. I know. Uh, so Donhauser, it's a very it used to be a. Uh, well, actually not Danhauser. There was a little town which is almost maybe the same size, maybe smaller. It was called Dernacol, which was a mining community. Uh, there was a big coal mine. Um, that whole area is, is known for its coal mining and farming. Um, so there was a, it was a mining town called Dernacol. So a lot of the kids went to Danhauser school. Um, and so, but they literally right next to each other. Um, but yeah, it's not a lot of people know where it is. Um, so when people ask me where I'm from, I normally say to them, I'm from Durban, because if I had to try and explain to them, where's Dan Houser, because if you drive past it and you blink, you've missed it. So it's, it's tiny. <laughs> no, I got you. I went to high school in a small rural area of Appalachia in Ohio. Uh, it's called, yeah. um, Junction City. And if I say Junction City, people like, huh, I just say Ohio. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it's just it's just easier. <laughs> it's just easier that way. So uh, Paulie Fire, seven, uh, seven Fire, who's a firefighter in South Africa, that hence the name Paulie Seven Fire. He uh, he says Andre was a beast. Uh, when you play. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I'd have to echo that. I'd have to echo that. Now, listen, Andre. OK, look, out of respect, I've worn a, an older Springbok jersey of mine. One that got sassy. As long as there. as long as it's green and gold, then you, you're on the right side. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I didn't want I didn't want my guests to abandon the, the interview just at the start of it because uh, people know that people know that I'm a Western Province Stormers fan. But uh, I do have Bulls yeah. jersey, but I wore I bull the I wore the Bulls jersey yesterday because Dr. Mulder was on my channel and he's from the High Veld. But uh, uh, th this is painful for me. I'm going to do this yeah. now. I just uh, okay. This you know this this is this is nothing but respect for you, Andre. Okay, so here you go. I've got this. There you go. All right. There you go. Your blood is blue. That's good. <laughs> is blue. <laughs> anyway, put that back on the shelf real quick. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, how did you get started in rugby? I mean, did you get an early start, or were you a late bloomer with rugby? Um, I mean, I've always been a sportsman. Um, I was very fortunate to come from a very sporty family. Um, my dad used to. Um, he went to Newcastle High School, and he was a, actually a, a soccer player or a football player. Mm -hmm. He was a pretty good um, athlete as well. Uh, my mom was a very good track and field athlete. Um, she played a little bit of hockey and netball in those days. Um, then my sister, she represented um, South Africa in netball. Um, so she got her colors in netball. My middle brother, he represented uh, his country or South Africa in horse riding. It's a sport called Gymkhana. Um, so he's got his colors in that. And then myself in obviously in rugby, as well as I represented my country or county, uh, which is Natal, mm -hmm. um, uh, at the um, South African Championships in track and field. Um, so we come, I'm um, come from a sporty family. So sport was always a big thing in our family. We've always been competitive. Um, you know, even in my current family, we always, um, joke with each other. The last one in the car is a, is a pumpkin or the last one, you know, somewhere is, is somewhere. there's always this competition in the family. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been there, but I, I mean, in the, in the early stages of my life, I've never thought about becoming a professional rugby player because, there was no such thing as a professional rugby player. Yeah. Rugby was seen as just a sat Saturday afternoon sport, eating oranges and bultong and have a beer. Um, so, so as a kid, there was no inspiration or aspiration to become a professional rugby player because there was no such thing. Um, uh, all you would just wanted to do is just go out there, play the game with your friends, whether it's at school level or whatever, um, and have fun. Um, and then, so when I went to college or university started playing there, same thing. There was no talk about professionalism or being paid to play rugby. Um, my dad sent me to college to go and study and then obviously finish studies and then come back to the farm and be part of the whole family farming community. Um, so it was, it's never crossed my mind. And then all of a sudden I played at the university and I got selected to play for Transvaal. And I was like, hold on a second. 
all of a sudden I'm, I'm getting a small little brown envelope every Friday afternoon after training. Shh. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> to, to, to wish me well, to wish me well, and I've been selected. That There was a letter in the brown envelope saying, congratulations, you've made the team. Um, so, and that's when I realized, hang on a second, maybe I, I'm okay, I'm, I'm good enough to, to play at a higher level. Um, but before that, I've always looked at guys like Nas Buerta, Donny Gerber, you know, Carl Duplessis. You know, I've watched those guys play and I was like, wow, these guys are awesome, you know. And you base yourself around that their game plan and everything and how they play. And um, I got to a point with, 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 with the Northern Transvaal at the time where I was like, okay, hang on. I had to make a choice between, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back to the farm? Am I going to keep on playing? Uh, and my mom just said to me, you know what, Andre, this is an opportunity. Why don't you go for it? You know, you've got nothing to lose. Um, you know, you can't play rugby until you're 50 years old, but you can work and study until you're 50 years old. So um, so I took my mom's advice and um, I decided, you know, I'm going to go. F- I'm going to put everything into rugby and train hard and and, and be committed and, and have the right attitude. And then all of a sudden, the doors just started opening up to me for me. Um, you know, I've been selected for the Bulls and then all of a sudden for the South African under-21 team. And, yeah, and then obviously the whole domino effect happened. Um, so, so yeah, to answer your question, it was not my priority to, to play high-profile rugby. It was, for me, rugby was just a means of having fun with my friends and throwing the ball around, you know, and then... I was fortunate to have a little bit of talent, speed, and power, um, and I used it to my benefit. Um, and then, obviously, somebody saw that, um, and they they put me in an environment where I can improve that, um, and then became the player that I that I that I was. No, it's interesting you mentioned that, Andre, because a lot of people are not familiar with the sport of rugby, or even people who've grown into it, you know, kids, youth these days, they don't realize that uh, it was an amateur sport throughout its history. Yeah. It's as a long storied history, of course. But it's, it's only become a professional sport 25 years ago. Uh, the me- yeah. famous meeting in Paris, in fact, it was this month, 25 years ago, that professional rugby was born, so to speak. Yeah, no, definitely. Like I said, I mean, it was, and I was part of that transition. You know, in 1994, you played for the Northern Transvaal and you only get a pat on your back. You know, you might get a little stipend just to pay for your fuel, um, you know, and then all of a sudden we had the 1995 World Cup. And then in 1996, all of a sudden, you know, you sign on a piece of paper on a dotted line and you're getting paid to play the game that you love. Um, so, yeah, and everything just changed. It was at first two, three years was really a, a testing time because nobody knew what does it mean to be a professional player? Just because now all of a sudden you get money every month, you know, yes, that's great. But, you know, what does it mean? Does it mean you have to run faster? Does it mean you have to jump higher? What does it mean? Where is it going to go? I mean, what do you do? What does it? Mean? But the big thing that was obviously training. Training changed because all of a sudden it went from you know maybe two trainings a week to everyday training because now they you can't use the excuse of oh sorry coach I have to go and work <laughs> because rugby was your work um, you know um, so so but but still nobody knew what does it mean to become a professional rugby player. And, you know, and I, and I saw a lot of, even looking back at my time and my career and the people around me at the time, um, the way we, we had to adapt and change. Uh, and, and I look at the way the kids are doing it now. You've got academies and, mm. you know, you're looking at kids at 19 years old playing in the professional um, international scene. It's just unbelievable. It's just amazing how the game has changed from 25 years ago. It's, it's unbelievable. No, it's absolutely amazing. For instance, for me, I was introduced to rugby as a freshman at university in 1982. Uh, one of the upperclassmen said, hey, you coming to the game tonight on a Friday afternoon? I'm like, uh, game's tomorrow. He goes, no, not football, American football. No, not football. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. R- rugby, I'm like, I've heard of rugby, but I'm from Appalachia, yeah. and we're just happy to have paved roads and electricity, you know? <laughs> so, which, which is a joke, but it was, pre- it was true. I didn't, yeah. ha- I didn't have electricity for a while there, but anyway. But uh, so... Uh, I went down to the game. There are no stands. We're just standing in touch on the side. They're watching it. Yeah. And I'm like, um, okay, it's this was the time when Australian Rules came out on ESPN, so we all knew what Australian Rules football was. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay, it's not Australian Rules. It's not soccer, thank God. It's not football. 
Okay, um, this is fun, but I have no idea what's going on here. And I fell yeah. in love with the game at that point. Of course, we didn't have a national team in the U.S., even though we were still the reigning Olympic champions from 1924. Correct, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't have a national team at that time. USA Rugby hadn't been set up. And so uh, I, uh, as a history student, uh, interested in history, started looking around and said, well, who am I going to follow? Because I want to follow it. And, of course, there was no cable networks and no satellite, none of this stuff. It yeah. was still amateur. And I looked and I saw that the, the Springboks and I had an interest in South Africa. Springboks had a storied history. And I said, you know what? I'm a Springbok fan. And I became yeah. a Springbok fan in 1984. And the first question I got was, what, are you a racist? I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, no, that's uh, unfortunately, I mean, South Africans are doomed. You know, I mean, it's we always we linked with that whole the big R, um, unfortunately. Yep. Um, you know, it's I think it's something that we're going to take with us to our graves one day. Um, everybody will put us under that um, uh, racist umbrella thinking that, you know, we, we, if you're from South Africa, you're automatically racist um, just because of what happened in the past. Um, but I mean, I think they need to catch a wake up. Uh, yeah. Time has moved on. You know, um, the apartheid era is not there anymore. Um, people that have that lived in that time and that era, I think most of them is probably six foot under the ground pushing up daisies right now. Yes. So, uh, so we need to try and change people's view on on South Africans. Um, so, but anyway, it's, it's funny. I mean, not so long ago, you know, in 2011, when I arrived in America, and if I say to people I'm from South Africa, they'll look at me and they're like, "Why are you white?" And uh, <laughs> you know, so are you? Do you live in those hut, those little hut houses and all do, that do stuff? And I'm like. Do you speak it's, South African? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, or they, or you'll say you're from South Africa, and they look at you and they go like, "Is that a country in Africa?" You know, it's just, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting people's reaction when when you say to them you're from South Africa. So, uh, so, so people are complaining there are too many shark fans in the chat room right now. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing, Andre. Uh, all of my streams, I always wear a rugby jersey. I got about eighty rugby jerseys. Uh, yeah, and I did. I did a video recently when the Sia Khaleesi's comments came out about his experiences, and 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 I, I I'm a fan of Sia Khaleesi, so I was kind of angry and upset about that. People were talking about cutting up their Springbok jerseys, and I so I did a video. It was kind of off the cuff. I, I hung up a little laundry thing here, and I lined up yeah. all of my Springbok jerseys, and I started saying, "Listen, um, Sia, you're just you're mistaken. You don't really understand what you're talking about with this group." And I said, "People were talking about cutting up their jerseys. I kept moving from side to side." And I said, I'm not cutting up my Springbok jerseys. Why no. would I do that? So anyway, that's actually been my best performing video to date with about 70,000 <laughs> views. And I, I didn't even study for it. Most of my videos, I do, I research them because, uh, you know, I used to be an analyst. Uh, you anyway. prepare. Yeah, and I prepare. This one was just like, okay, look, guys, I, I'm not cutting up my jerseys. And people want to watch no. that sort of thing. So, good, yeah, good. So, so I always wear a jersey on here. And um, I try to do it usually um, either it represents where someone's from if they're in South Africa or, or I just wear one that because I have Canadian, I have U.S., I have, I have Wales, I have Ireland, I have all kinds of jerseys, uh, Japan. Anyway, so I, I try to wear one every time. It's kind of my thing. So people are always talking about rugby in the stream, which is good. Uh, one of my goals but, here is to get people talking about rugby, wherever it's at in the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean I'm a firm believer that, uh, the sport rugby is a um, – is uh, what's the right wording? It's, it's a bridge. It's a bridge between cultures and and countries um, because you can you can play rugby in any. I mean, if you go to any country in the world, you'll probably find a team or a club that plays rugby. But you can't go to any country and they won't play basketball, for example. They won't play baseball um, or American football or stuff like that. So, but if you go to India, for example, India is known for cricket, yeah. but they have a rugby team. There's there's a really good um, rugby community there at the moment. You know, you'd never think that, but that's why I say. And, and the beauty about rugby is it's it's a brotherhood uh, or a sisterhood, so to speak. Uh, you know, if if you go to Australia, New Zealand, anywhere in the world, and you and you go to their local rugby club, and you just walk in there, you know, and you say, "Hey, I'm a South African rugby player," or "I'm from South Africa, I play rugby," or "From America, I play rugby." It's almost like they accept you and they start talking to you about rugby because everybody knows exactly, you know, what the sport is all about and everything. And they, it's almost like they'll help you. And it's just an amazing sport to build um, bridges between countries. It's, it's. I love it. I love rugby. No, it's absolutely amazing, and that's one of the reasons why I've loved the game too. Um, you know, when I went to Uganda. I met a South African who ran the the Marriott or the Hilton, whichever the hotel is there. I forget. I think it was the Hilton. And um, it was my first week there. And he's like, hey, uh, why don't you come to the championships tomorrow? I'm like, okay. So he got me a seat and I went there. And after, yeah. after it was over, I met a bunch of the players who won the 
the championship side, but they played for the for the Cranes, which is the national team. And they start talking to me, and we're talking about rugby, and they're like, "Hey, so hey, why don't you come be one of our coaches?" And co I'm like, "You want me to yeah. coach you, Ghana national side?" I'm like, <laughs> okay, but no, but seriously, it's a game that really draws yeah. people in. When I was in Japan. Yeah. I saw all these guys outside one of the games. I went to a game, and um, they're wearing these T-shirts, and they all had Quagga Smith's picture on it. So I couldn't help it. I walked over and started talking to them. I said, hey, um, are you guys fanboys? What's going on? You know, and they said, no, Quagga's on our team. I'm like, huh? Because uh, he, he plays in Japan. That was There were yeah. the players from the team there, and a lot of them were South Africans, so it was pretty yeah. cool. But, yeah, you're no, right. That's it's, awesome. It's just a game that brings people together no matter where you go. When I went to yeah. New Zealand for the 2011 World Cup, I went to uh, all over the country, but I was in Wellington. And Auckland has a lot of white Afrikaans speaking South Africans who live there. Auckland, for some reason, or not Wellington, for some reason, has a lot of colored South Africans who speak Afrikaans. Yeah. And I was staying in the Amora Hotel. I walked downstairs wearing my Springbok jersey, even though they weren't in town. And um, someone had greeted me in Afrikaans, and I said, hello, how are you, Doc? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he started talking to me, and I walked, I said, hey, ek prat me Afrikaans ni. And he's like, <laughs> yes, you do. You just spoke it. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> no, no, I understand it is a problem. I just can't yeah. speak it. The G's kill me. But yeah. uh, but anyway, so so I was, they were Marvel because I'm an American. I was in the military station in Germany. So I live in Germany. I'm an American. I've come to New Zealand, and I'm a Springbok fan. And they just couldn't yeah. get their head around that. It was really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's like a, it's almost like a party trick. I mean, obviously, me being born in South Africa, um, you know, and then obviously having a, an American passport as well. So sometimes when people ask me, so Andre, you know, what nationality are you? So I'll say to now I'm African American, you know. So <laughs> it's a, it's like a party trick, and they're like, oh, no, you're not, you're not. I'm like, yes, I was born in Africa, but I'm an American passport, so I'm African American, you know. So it's like a bit of a a party trick sometimes. Yeah, no, uh, John Kerry's wife said that because she's Portuguese from uh, from Mozambique. I think she grew up in Mozambique. And yeah. uh, she said, I'm African-American. And people look, they're like, huh? What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 just, it's just interesting to sometimes see people's reaction. That's that's all. So it's no, fun. I, I agree with you entirely. So uh, <laughs> there's a question here from uh, Brett, Brett Sessoms, who's an American from Mississippi, who knows a lot about Africa. He follows the channel. Um, he said, uh, so does Andre have any other sports interests besides rugby, thoughts on cricket, soccer, and baseball? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a, uh, a quite a fanatic golfer. Okay. Um, I really love my golf. Um, so obviously, being a professional rugby player, we had a lot of time on our hands. Uh, so we would train in the morning and then go play golf in the midday, or go to the driving range and then train in the afternoons and weekends. We'll play golf after a game. So yeah, I'm a, I'm quite a fanatic golfer. Um, and then other hobbies is fishing. I quite enjoy bass fishing um, as well as archery. Um, oh, cool. So I'm into, I enjoy my compound bow. Um, I got my son into that as well. So my son, uh, he's into archery and fishing and golfing and basically a chip of the old block. Um, so I'm trying to, both my kids, I'm trying to introduce them to as many sports as, as I can. Um, just to, they don't have to be the best in it. As long as they're competitive, as long as they can compete and they just have fun, um, yeah. So I would say my my other sports, um, other. I mean, obviously, as a younger kid, I did track and field. Um, I really enjoyed my track and field. Uh, but now that I'm during my rugby season career and after rugby, um, I've decided to do things that I still can do, no matter what my age, uh, which is golf, archery. Um, and those things. So those are the sports that I enjoy. I was never be. I've never been a cricket player. Never played cricket in my life. I've never never played a match. Um, but being a sportsman, hand eye coordination, put a bat in my hand, I'd probably be able to hit a ball. I'll probably bowl out the second ball. Um, you know, or baseball. I'll probably I'll be able to hit a ball. I won't be good, uh, but I can try. So, uh, but yeah, those those are pretty much my interests. No, you're pretty much just a sportsman across the board. I'm like you. I've done pretty much all that except for archery. I mean, I've I've fired bows before, but I never did it competitively. Yeah. So, that's uh, the, the golf is a great one too. When you play a high, a high contact sport, golf is a good thing to kind of unwind from because you're not you're not running into anybody. <laughs> yeah, and and exactly, and you can't get too frustrated with it, you know, because as soon as you start getting frustrated um, or you overcompensate, you know, then you you're just losing it. Then the ball is going to go all the way. So you really have to like, you know, focus channel your energy and, 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 and do something with finesse. You know, it's a finesse game. It's not a, a game about power and strength. Uh, as soon as you bring power and strength and, you know, grip and rip into the game, you, you know, it's, it's not going to work. So it's, it's a bit of a 
finesse game. You got to like it's all about touch and feel, which is which is good. Well, I like that calm measure. I, when when I play, my my five iron winds up in a water trap after. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend. He says to me, "I don't know why I've got a whole golf set. I only need three clubs: a seven iron, a sand wedge, and a putter." <laughs> That's it. Exactly right. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly all he right. needs. <laughs> so Brett Sessoms asked another question, Andre, and it's a good one. Uh, I think I can answer part of it. So let me see. Yeah. He asked, "How many languages do you speak?" Well, of course, I'm going to guess Afrikaans and English. Uh, do you know any Zulu? Yes, so I um, I speak Afrikaans, Zulu, um, and English, and then I used to be able to speak German and Polish. Oh, Polish. Um, yeah, so the German is because when you were at school, uh, German was one of the subjects that we had to take, uh, but obviously after school, I never carried on talking, so I wouldn't say my I'm, I'm a fluent in, in German. Polish is because um, I was married, my ex-wife, um, my my first wife was uh, Polish, so I could speak. I couldn't speak it, but I could understand it. So I could do your normal, you know, hello and can you please pass me this and just get around. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, Zulu. I could speak fluently, absolutely fluently, because I grew up on a farm. Um, I could actually speak Zulu before I could speak Afrikaans uh, because mom and dad was working on the farm. So the nanny would look after me as a baby. Um, so she would like up until the age of about two, three, four years old, the nanny on the farm would look after me and interact with me and feed me and all that. stuff. So all I heard the whole time was was the Zulu language. Um, so I could speak that. I picked it up very quickly. But unfortunately, as you get older, you know, you lose touch. Uh, but I can fluently understand it. I can 100% understand it. Um, it's just sometimes the words, the grammar, the words. Uh, in my head, I know exactly what I want to say. But for some reason, the words just don't want to come out. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, those, I would, I would probably say three languages, um, English, Afrikaans, and Zulu. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting you said And that. then also, and then obviously gibberish, gibberish as well, you know, it's at about three o'clock in the morning after a few drinks. So I can speak <laughs> that language as well. <laughs> well, I guess you're not drinking Casa Lager because there's not much in nah, that. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah, I like to give South Africans a hard time because they don't have any decent beer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And people are like, wait a second, you're coming from America. No, we have a craft brew industry that sprung up 30 years ago, and it's saved, yeah. our, it saved our beer industry. We Otherwise, you have that, that watered-down urine that you get from the major makers. But anyway, I'm, oh, kind, no. of, I'm kind of a beer snob. Um, German Reinheitsgebot, it has to be by that, or I don't drink it. But uh, but you, you do raise a point there, Andre, that uh, unintentionally, that uh, something I'd like to mention is that, you know, I meet so many uh, South Africans, especially black South Africans, who say that, oh, you know, whites have to learn uh, an African language. And almost every Afrikaans speaking South African I've ever met knows an African language beyond Afrikaans because they grow up in similar circumstances yeah. where they've got a nanny uh, at the time and, and, and the first language they usually learn is Tswana or Siswati or, 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 or Venda or Kosa, whatever it is. Correct. So they all yeah. speak it. So, I mean, it, it's just always bothered me that people just make assumptions based on a person, on their appearance yeah. and just assume they don't know another language. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, at school, in primary school, up until the age of 13, we had Zulu as one of our subjects at school. Um, so you had to, because in South Africa, we, I mean, I think the, the curriculum has changed, but you had to do Afrikaans and English, and then you had to choose another language. Um, so, you know, if your first language was Afrikaans, you had to do English as a second language, and then you could choose another language, either Zulu um, or German and, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, so we had to, at school level, we had to you, learn the basics of a, a, a third language, so to speak. And because we had also a lot of Germans in the Dundee uh, community uh, in and around Dundee, that's why they offered German as a subject at the school um, so yeah, I mean it's 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 one of those things, you know. Growing up in a country where there's eleven official languages, I think it's just it's going to happen where, you know, cultures, different cultures will pick up different languages because you hear that the whole time. You might not be fluent in it, but you'll be able to say, you know, hello, goodbye, help me with this, or how much is this, or so. You'll get the necessary, you know phrases words so to speak that uh from the other languages i mean you might not have a complete debate session on it but you know you'll be able to get by 
It's interesting you mentioned that. I was going to bring it up, but you just brought it kind of back up again. You talk about Dundee. Um, I, I do research on ethnic Germans. It's one of the things I write on all over the world, whether it's in Transylvania, it's the Amish in, in the States, it's it's Germans in Italy and South Thrill, German speakers. Uh, South Africa, there's a lot of ethnic Germans, and they actually, DNA-wise, Germans comprise the largest percentage of the Afrikaans community, the white yep. Afrikaans community. People, people think it's Dutch. Yep. They're second. It's actually German because so many Germans came in and Germans have this habit of assimilating very quickly. And when I was in in, in KZN, um, I was in Dundee and Elenskral and yeah. uh, and, and uh, all over. Did and you I, go? To, go ahead. Did you go to Blood? Did you go to Blood River? Of course, I've been to Blood River. I've been to Isan <laughs> Luana. I've been to Rourke's yeah. Drift. I've never been to Spienkop. I've driven by it, but never been up to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one day I'll get there. But but what I was getting at in that is is that um, I, I went to uh, a hotel there in Dundee, and the woman I met was a German speaker because she had German things on the wall. She owned the hotel. Yeah. She was, this was like 20 years ago. She was in her late 60s or 70s, something like that. And it turns out that her family was from Angola. They were ethnic Germans who lived in Angola. Then after the First World War, they were relocated to Namibia. She was born in Namibia. She moved to South Africa uh, with her family later on. And she had a hotel in Dundee. So that's where I stayed. Yeah. And then uh, I went to Elonskral and uh, I met a um, German Lutheran pastor who was a fourth generation South African, first language German, Second language, uh, English. Third language, Afrikaans. Fourth language, Zulu. Spoke all of them fluently. Yeah. It's just wow. amazing. It's amazing how many Germans yeah. are there. And he was. We were yeah. speaking between English and Afrikaans and German because I, I'm fluent in German. And we're mixing this up. And in the conversation, I, I thought he told me he'd never been to Germany. And, okay, got that. And then he's like, he was showing me the watercolors on his wall in his office. And there's a painting yeah. of a church where he worked in Heilbronn, one where he worked in, <laughs> in Heidelberg, and one where he worked. And I'm like, I, listen, I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood because my Afrikaans is not that good. Or maybe yeah. I, said, I thought you'd never been to Germany. He goes, I've never been to Germany. I said, but you said Heilbronn. And he goes, here in KwaZulu Natal. I'm like, oh, that's right. Yeah, lots of Germans in KZN. Yeah, no, there's, there's, especially in the northern parts of uh, of uh, the province, there's, there's definitely that Dundee, Ladysmith area, there's a lot of Germans there. Absolutely. So if I could digress, digress for a second there, your family had a farm. What sort of farm was it? I mean, because when I think of KwaZulu Natal, I think of, of sugarcane fields down along the coast. Yeah, no, sh the sugarcane f the farms were further or closer to the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, we were, like I say, we were like a three hour drive inland. You, obviously, you know where Dundee is. Yep. Um, so we were um, corn, corn farmers. Oh, so maize, um, okay. Yeah, maize. We were corn farmers, maize, and then cattle and sheep. So dad had like a little system to feed the cattle. We had to provide our own food. And then once you've harvested the food, all the rests are lying on the ground. It's a perfect feed. So we push the cows into the, into the land to eat the rests. And then once the rests are done, you know, we push them onto the, the, the grasslands and then we we cultivate the land again and then we plant the, the mealies again. So it's like a vicious circle between the, the mealies, the cows and the sheep. So that's that's it. Uh, so that's what I mean. So my dad was pretty was pretty a decent farmer. Uh, he, he was quite big. He had a couple of. Uh, managers working for him and then my brother also worked for my father while i was studying um but but yeah so unfortunately dad uh, dad fell ill um, and then he uh, obviously passed away and then once dad passed away the farming just got too big uh, so we decided to scale it down um, so we sold a lot of the farms lock stock barrel everything we got rid of everything and uh, so mom decided to retire uh, my brother took his inheritance and he's still in dundee my brother's still in dundee and he's got his own little farm set up there now um, and then my mom she lives in dundee as well um, as a nice retired old lady <laughs> <laughs> your brother is that tian uh, no, Nas. I've only got one brother. He's okay. not, his name is his name is actually Ignatius, okay. but we all know him as Nas. Okay, so, that makes sense. No, somebody yeah, said I something. I just I just want to I just want to clarify. Hopefully, a lot of South Africans listen. Yeah. Um, I've only got one brother, yeah. and his name is Nas, <laughs> um, because everybody with the surname Sneeman is not my family member. <laughs> um, so, um, because a lot of people are asking me, um, oh, is this one? Is this this your brother? Is this and this your cousin? And I'm like, no, no, I've only got two cousins and their name is Rulof and Herman. Uh -huh. So those are my cousins. <laughs> my brother is Nas. So I just want to clear that up. <laughs> well, the reason I asked that question is because one of my viewers asked the question and they ask about your brother Tian. And I'm like, I no. don't know that he has a brother named Tian. No, no. That was news to me. But, you know, I mean, I don't always have all the answers. So I thought maybe I yeah. missed something here. But yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, a lot of people ask me, you know, there was a, even today on Facebook, a gentleman asked me, um, 
He was at school with a guy down in Cape Town and at the Strunt. His name is Yaku, Yaku Sneiman. Is he, and, and this person, Yaku Sneiman, um, told everybody that he's my cousin. Uh, uh, no, he's yeah. he's not my cousin. <laughs> um, you know, and every, everybody asks me if Tian Sneiman is my brother, Archie Sneiman is my brother, Philip uh, Sneiman is my brother. You know, they, yes, there's a lot of Sneimans in the rugby world, but none of them are. I, I guess we're very, very, very far related. I assume, but what, as my knowledge, no, uh, I've only got one brother and two cousins. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's why I asked that question. So, folks, you're yeah. listening to Chris White Africa on the Adab Africa channel on a special feature Sunday. My guest is Springbok number 636, Andre Snayman, right here down in the bottom corner of the screen. Uh, uh, welcome to anyone tuning in now. The audience is uh, starting to gain a bit of strength here as we go on. But I did want to ask you a little bit because taking a look at the list of Springboks and remembering back to those days, um, you've played with a few names that people know. I mean, this, this oak called Rossi Erasmus, didn't you play with him? Yeah, Rossi, uh, Rossi and I, we were teammates. Uh, yeah, no, we uh, we come a long way uh, back with the Springbok uh, playing days. You know, um, I've I've been fortunate to to play underneath uh, seven Springbok coaches. I don't know if it's fortunate or bad luck, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it just shows that there was a lot of change once again. That whole transition between semi-pro to pro and the coaches and everything. It just shows that. You know, unfortunately, there was a lot of turnover in coaches. Um, so I used to play seven Springbok coaches coached me um, during my Springbok career. Um, I used to play with guys like the belated old U.S. Van Vestazen, which yeah. was probably my my best mate. Um, we uh, we used to be roommates for more than seven years on tour. Um, there was a standard joke uh, to say that him and I, we actually slept in the same room more than we slept with our own wives and girlfriends. Uh, so, so we, we, we shared, <laughs> yeah, we've got some lot of stories to share. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed playing with Joost. We had guys like, um, you know, Ruben Kruger, unfortunately also passed away. Uh, Os Durant, uh, Oli LaRue, Os, Os Durant, <laughs> Oli LaRue. The, the big old uh, tall Mark, uh, Mark Andrews, uh, Kurbis Visa, you know, uh, funny enough, Joel Stransky, um, James Small, Chester Williams, Andre Joubert. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on of legends of the game. Um, so, yeah, I was very fortunate to, to play against with them and against them. And then, you know, even guys like the current or more younger guys, Jean de Villiers, uh, John Smith, uh, you know, uh, the, those guys, I played with them as well. So, but that was towards the end of my career. Uh, so it was, it was really uh, a good career. It was a really long, uh, fulfilling career. Um, I've seen a lot, went to a lot of places. Uh, but yeah, there were some really, really good players in our era that we played. Franz Chopina was also one of them uh, that I played with and against. Uh, Gary Teichman. So uh, yeah, there's some really some, some good names there. No, it's it's funny to hear you say though, uh, Andre, to say the the younger guys like John Smith. <laughs> yeah, know, I mean that's that's now like two generations removed of spring boxing. Yeah. Because for me, a, a cohort is like five years. I call that a rugby generation. Because yeah. I mean, that's just you know in, you know informally, I'd say that's it. Because usually that's when you have a group of people together that who were together a long time. It's five years at best. So that's really that's a couple generations removed already. And you're saying yeah. the, the young guys. That's kind of funny. I know because I mean, like I say, I mean, I mean, I'm 46 right now, and I'm, I'm not sure how old John is. But I mean, I remember it was I was coming to the end of my career, you know, and then John and Jean and those guys, they just started their career. So there was a good, you know, more than eight, nine years uh, age difference between us, you know. Um, so and we as older senior players, we always talked about the young guns, you know, the young guns are coming through, you know. So that's why in our eyes, unfortunately, they'll always be the younger generation or the younger players, you know, because we were the old hags, uh, the old war horses in the corner of the room. <laughs> no, I, I got you. But I mean, the list of players that are iconic that you play with, Percy Montgomery, you play with, didn't you? Yep, yeah, absolutely. You, Yanni DeBeer. I mean, that just the list goes on. It's, fa it's fantastic. It's uh, It must have been an exciting time. Oh, yeah, that's right. You also played, I believe, with with uh, uh, Province uh, Stormers coach Robbie Fleck. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. Robbie Fleck as well. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Not a lot of stuff. Now, so, um, did you ever play with Brian Habana on a pitch? Yes. Brian Habana as well. Yeah. Towards, like I said, towards the end of the, my career, uh, you know, 2006, um, you know, Brian and, 
John de Villiers and John Smith, um, you know, those guys. And then obviously Bobby Skinstad, everybody yeah, remember yeah. Bobby Skinstad. Yeah, he was also part of that uh, that era as well. Quite fascinating stuff. It's, it was an exciting time, I think, that transition and you moved those. You guys really, really moved the Springboks to it. Now, now something we got to fix here, though. Listen, I don't know if you can help the Springboks out. Uh, Rossi has moved up to management, <laughs> but no, seriously, this every 12 year nonsense has to stop. I can't wait 12 years <laughs> for another cup. I mean, you know, 95, 2007, 2019. I don't want to wait till 12 years next time. <laughs> no, definitely. I agree with you on that one. I mean, it was a really, really great uh, World Cup, especially being in England when that happened, um, you know, just rubbing uh, dirt in the English face. Uh, so it was really fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I really hope I think the Springboks are on the right track at the moment. You know, they've they come, they've come, they've got some super, super players in there at the moment. Um, I really hope they can all stay fit and healthy for the next three, four years, you know, uh, going into the next World Cup. Um, you know, I just wish them luck and I wish the coaching staff all the best and I hope they they do the right thing and let the players express themselves. Um, you know, and I, I think the players know what's on the line and what they play for. Um, so, you know, and I, I think I think they, you know, if they just keep the core, it's a, I mean, if you look at that team, it's a, it was a very young team. Mm. Um, you know, they can definitely stay together for another four years. Uh, I think more than 80% of that team is, is old enough to play another World Cup. Um, you know, so hopefully they, uh, hopefully they can do that again or give it a good run and not wait for 12 years. No, absolutely. I think that is the case. And they had a few uh, really, really talented younger kids coming up behind. They didn't make that, that team. And in fact, I argued, uh, while I was happy with the team selection, I argued there were actually a few spring boxes that I thought might have been better selections in certain positions. But as a team, Rossi hit it spot on. This was yeah. the team he needed to make this happen. And yeah. uh, of course, they made history being the first team to ever lose a pool stage and then win the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, it's like you just said it, you know, sometimes as a coach, you know, you don't always want to pick the best player with the best talent. You want to pick the best, the, the player that's good, the best for the team. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, sometimes you got to put the, the, the player with a better skill on the bench um, and, and pick the player with lesser skill. But he, he he just brings that X factor potentially to the team, and he, he's like maybe the, the the glue of the team. He might not be as skillful, but you need him in your team to keep the team together. And I feel like you said, I think Rossi, he, he, I think his combination was was pretty spot on. Yeah, and it's it's the thing I love about rugby, Andre, is is that is it you, you don't have to be the best player on the pitch. You just have to be able to fill a role that helps the team win. And that's I think that's what you're kind of talking about there. Yeah. No, definitely, because I mean, I feel now that I'm a coach, you sometimes you look at the player and you as a coach can see this player or this kid has got so much talent. Uh, but the problem that's happening at the moment is they know it. So they become like full of themselves and that could potentially damage the team if they've got this attitude running on the pitch, knowing that they're the best player, knowing that they they are the number one player um, and it causes more damage than anything else because they would not, if there's a situation to whether they should draw and pass or whether they're going to score, they're probably going to throw the dummy and go themselves because they want the accolades where a, a, a lesser player would probably go, you know what, I'm going to put the ball into the player's hands, which is in a better position yeah. and, and not go for that accolades, signing autographs and all that stuff. It's, it's rather put someone else in a better position. Um, so yes, I mean it's 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 a tough one as a coach to get that combination right between playing your skillful player and your lesser skillful player. I mean, if you can get a skillful player with the right attitude, you know that's a winning combination. And and it also becomes a challenge for a coach too. Like, let me shift to sevens for just a second. Uh, but uh, look at the USA. We've got Carlin Isles and Perry Baker. Oh my God, that's two of the unbelievable best players on the planet. And Mike Friday has a tough choice. It's 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 a really difficult situation because when if if we're objective, when both of them are on the pitch, the team doesn't play as well. Not because yeah. either one of them fail, but because they're similar and it just doesn't it doesn't yeah. it doesn't gel. But when he he platoons them and puts uh, Perry out to start or Carlin out to start, he gets far better results and they play as a team better. It's just the way it works out. No, absolutely. I mean, it's like you said, it, it's to find that balance. It's to find that balance in a team. You can't have a team with just speed. Yeah. or a team with just bulk, you know, or a team that with, with just defending because, uh, you know, so you got to find that balance between 
when are you going to use the speed? When are you going to use the strength? When are you going to use the one out runners, just punch it up through the middle? You know, you got to, as a coach, you got to know your horses. You got to know the players you're working with. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And then you got to select. And then obviously know your opposition. You got to know your opposition as well. Who are you playing against to, you know, are you going to play speed against this team? Are you going to play physically against this uh, opponent? So, and that's why, and, and you're absolutely right, by putting two speedsters on a team at the same time, I don't think that's the right combination. Uh, you, you, you're probably only going to do that if you're playing against a really big, strong team um, to, to, to out, outrun them. But the problem then is normally your speedsters are not your best defenders. So if you play against a big team that's just going to carry the ball all against you, Yes, you're going to beat them with speed, but they're going to run through you and score tries. So you got to you got to have that balance between having big boys on your team to make the tackles and then also enough speed to run around them. You know, so you got to be very careful how you pick your teams. Absolutely with you. So one one of my moderators just reminding people, listen, if you want to ask questions, you got to put the at Chris in front of it so it gets to my attention. But a lot of questions are coming, and we're not going to get to all these questions. So no worries. Um, yeah. Now, now you you did play with Ash Villemse as well when you played, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one of my one of my viewers asked a question, and you don't have to answer this, Andre. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but he's asking your thoughts on the Ash Villem Villemse controversy. Let me let me just say this before whether you want to address it or not is that uh, I'm a fan of Ash. I, I liked him as a player. Um, I found his commentary uh, for rugby interesting. I didn't always agree with it, but I found it interesting, and, mm-hmm. I, I, and I like his voice. I like his attitude, and I was really crushed by the whole situation that happened there with Nas, and uh, and it just really was um, really disappointing. I don't know if if you want to comp in it, you're welcome I mean, to. But- I mean, I don't I don't want to go too, into too much depth on it. Um, I'm not a politician. Um, good and I, good and I move. Politi- good move. <laughs> and I hate politics and sport. Uh, politics and sport um, always kill the game. Um, you know, all I can say is he was a he was a good player yep. he was one of the 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 lesser fortunate players coming through the ranks and and he made it work for himself um he benefited from it um you know but at the end of the day i think towards the end he made his bed and he's got to sleep in it um so that's that's all i can say on that one you know it's, it's yeah. just uh, sometimes in life you've got to take um have the courage of your conviction uh, and i think that's what happened uh, and it's just sad that there's a lot of um, animosity and, and 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 hostility in the country between the blacks and the whites. It, it's it, it's the big R, the big racism thing about South Africa, and and it's just sad. It's really sad that sometimes people can't just let it go and and just say, you know what, we we all we all bl- all our blood is red. Everybody's yeah. blood is red. We all breathe the same air, uh, you know. But but yeah, Ashwin, unfortunately, you know, good player. Um, all I can say is, I mean, he made his bed and he's got to sleep in it and he's got to take responsibility for his actions. Yeah. No, the, the thing for me that was disappointing is that now I never hear about the guy anymore. He's just yeah. kind of fallen off the earth and that's unfortunate. So, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there. And, and thanks for answering that. You, you didn't have to feel no much. So. Uh, so now Brett ask a, and Brett's ask another question here. It's a really good. There's a lot of them here, but I pulled these out as we were chatting. Brett asked no a question about uh, about Namibia. Now, I'm a Velvicious fan. I'm a huge Namibia fan. Jacques Borger, one of my all time favorite rugby players. Uh, I watched him uh, at the 2015 World Cup in England uh, when he was injured against Georgia, and Namibia was tantalizingly close, 17 to 16. And I was sitting at the end of the pitch in the in the seats at the end, and I'm like, I got a terrible seat because it was the only seat I can get. Turns out almost the entire game was played right in front of me there, both halves. Oh, brilliant. It was brilliant. <laughs> and, and I was there, and he got injured, and they, they almost beat. That would have been their first win. Uh, but uh, So he's asking about Namibia improving their game. What I tell people about Namibia and the other – tier two, tier three teams, including USA rugby, which is getting up there. But um, you're never going to improve if you don't play against the big boys. If the only time that maybe ever plays against the Springboks or the, the Wallabies or, or England or Wales is in a rugby world cup, they'll never get there. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, unfortunately, I think Namibia is in a, is in a, between a rock and a hard place. You know, they want to improve. I think they've got really quality players, um, but there's a couple of factors what we got to uh, consider. First of all, uh, the location, yeah. you know, you've got players scattered all over the country um, and it's not a logistically, it's a nightmare to get your players to trainings. I mean, some of those boys, I think they drive like three hours to training there and back. You know, it's just, it's just unfortunately the d- demographics of the country. Um, so I think if that could potentially change and you can have, you know, more players uh, um, 
closer to the city that can play that will be uh, a, a beneficial for the team. Um, I think that's the one thing. The second thing is it's 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 funding. It's it's the money um, to be able to to travel with this team to go play the bigger the bigger unions or the bigger teams. You know, um, I'm not sure how strong the union is financially um, to be able to say right, let's go and play against South Africa as a warm up game, or let's go play against you know, England or Ireland or Italy. It's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough ask for, for Namibia, which is a really small state. I mean, it's the same question can be asked of uh, Georgia, uh, yeah. Russia. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate that I think the tier two nations, you know, they do struggle to find the game time financially, logistically, to be able to play against the tier one nations. I mean, as it is, the tier one nations has a lot of games on their plate anyway, because they play so many games against and competitions. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's baby steps. It's just baby steps. But I mean, I think the first initial answer that comes to my head about Namibia is the logistics of the, of the actual country. It's, it's to, because I've, I'm very good friends with the, one of the team members that went to the recent World Cup, Vian Conradi. I mean, he's a superb player. He played here in England. Um, he's back in Namibia at the moment. Um, uh, he's just managed to sign a, a deal with a team in Texas. Um, you know, so, I mean, and I've been talking to him and we, we like literally WhatsApp each other every week, uh, once a week. Um, and, and, and he said to me that the, the problem is, is to get the players a training, um, you know, is to, is to, be able to to get more numbers at training and stuff like that and that's the problem uh it's it's just unfortunately the logistics of the of the country well it also touches something else a couple of years ago i wrote an article which uh, i don't know if you know Dallin stanford perhaps you probably do yes i know because his relationship with glendale raptors but pocky yeah pocky that's a guy yeah <laughs> don't tell me <him> said that <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no uh Dallin, uh Dallin and i are friends and um we were ta- we we're talking about so he has this thing the rugby corner and so he used to put articles on there so i wrote an article which he published for a while and it was about um my opposition to expansion to the world cup adding more teams not that i don't want to see more teams but but there are, in my view, some serious problems with rugby union that had to be addressed first. For instance, bankrupt rugby unions. We're talking about USA Rugby bankrupt. Saru essentially bankrupt at that time. They had to take the game against Wales in D.C. just to get a paycheck for $750,000. I mean, I was happy to go to a third world stadium in D.C. to watch them play. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but they were bankrupt. That's why they did it. And then we see Zimbabwe going to Tunisia to qualify for the World Cup. And they were thrown out of their hotel and they had to sleep rough because there was no money to pay for the hotel bill. Yeah. That, that, that's not a healthy state of, of, of the game. Mm. No, no, definitely. I mean, if you look currently, I mean, obviously, England, the RFU is talking about cutting their sevens program. Ooh. I mean, yesterday, yep, yesterday I saw on, uh, on the news uh, the Wales, the Welsh union, they are um, considering cutting their sevens program as well. Wow. Um, I mean, it's sad. It's sad seeing these unions cutting the, the, the sevens programs. Um, and it's, I don't know if it's mismanagement of money. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's, whether the top, the, the, the directors and the, the big, the big guns making the decisions, whether they take too much money um, and not spending the money in the right places. Um, I, I don't have the answers to that, but it's just sad to see, you know, these unions and, 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 and teams cutting their, 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 their teams. Like, I mean, the sevens, I mean, sevens is an Olympic sport. And now you're taking Welsh out of the equation. You're taking England out of the equation. You know, it's, it's just, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre to see, wow. you ask yourself, how did it happen? Why is it happening? You know, is, are they spending the money in the wrong places? And are they filling their pockets instead of filling, you know, the stadiums? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a tough, once again, politics. I mean, politics will always kill the game. So they're, England's talking about cutting their sevens team, so yeah. we, won't, we won't see Dan Norton anymore? Seriously? Nope. That's nope. insane. There's That's a big, insane. There was a big story on the news about the, the RFU sevens players um, and how they've been treated um, in the last two weeks. Um, they literally just got an email saying, um, sorry, this is what's going to happen. The program has been cut. Um, you, you're no longer part of the the sevens program there is no sevens program it's it's just been horrible it's absolutely been horrible and i think the i see the welsh union is now going that same route uh thinking of cutting their sevens program that's crazy 
Folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Daba Africa channel. My special feature guest today is Andre Saman, Springbok number 636, uh, rugby coach. And uh, now I'm going to break a card or rule here, Andre, because I don't ever ask questions I don't know the answer to. Shh, don't tell people that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I did that a little bit earlier with the question about your brother because I was puzzled by it. Who wasn't your brother, Tion? <laughs> but um, so this is a question, and I, I, you have to be careful with these. So this guy said, uh, said ask, when Andre finishes coaching, will he be forced to do Lay's potato chip commercials? What's that all about? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as long as he's as long as he writes the check, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. No, I'll, uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing after my coaching. Um, I love my coaching at the moment, and I'm going to coach as long as I can, um, even if it's in a wheelchair. Um, that's my passion. Uh, I love coaching and I got into coaching a very weird way. Um, but yeah, it's or interesting way, should I say? And, um, but yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm going to stop coaching very soon. Um, unless there's a, a real, real opportunity falling on my lap. Um, I doubt I'll, uh, but even then uh, I'll still be, I'll still be coaching in the background as a, as a hobby, no matter what. Um, I, I absolutely enjoy developing players um, and and sharing the love of the game uh, with them. That's awesome. So there's 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 a lot of stuff here. You you kind of let it out of the bag earlier. You kind of ruined my scoop there. I didn't you know. <laughs> but uh, but let's go to this now. So listen, I want to uh, formally welcome you to the club. And what I mean by that, I think you know already, but the audience may not know. Uh, on just July twenty third, twenty nineteen, Andre Schneeman became an American citizen. Correct. Yep. Correct. Well, welcome to the club. No, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people have asked me why. Um, why have I become a, an American? Um, and it's simple. Uh, it's it's not it's not because of for me. It's not. Um, it's for my kids. Um, it's purely for my kids. I made this decision for my kids is to give them an opportunity in life. Uh, to give them a, a dis, uh, an opportunity to make a decision where they want to be in the world. Because unfortunately, having a South African passport, it limits your opportunities where you can live in the world where you can work in the world where you want to travel just even if it's traveling um, and I've and, and I've been on the on the receiving end of that throughout my career um, when the team goes through that line because I'm a foreigner I have to go through the alien line um, and I have to get visas and it's just an absolute mess if you want to travel on a South African visa and I've decided you know what I will not I want to try my best for my kids not to go through that. And um, I got this opportunity to go to America. Um, I was fortunate that my wife, she's got a green card at the time. Um, so we went through the whole application process. Um, it took us eight years to, to do it. Uh, but yeah, it's eight years well, well um, wasted or spent. Um, and, um, it's, uh, yeah, so my, I'm very happy. My kids are American citizens. Now they can go anywhere in the world, uh, and they can choose where they want to be, what they want to do. Um, and that was the real, that was the reason why I'll, it was top priority for me to get my citizenship so that my kids can get it. Um, because it's their future. It's, it's not about me. It's about them. That's awesome, uh, yeah, but like I said, seriously, welcome to the, welcome to the the, uh, the Thank team. Thank you very much. You, you're very welcome. Uh, but the thing is, is that what, what people talk about America, they really don't understand or know much about America, including a lot of Americans. It seems talk about how America. <laughs> no, seriously, they talk about America as a, a place that doesn't welcome people. We naturalize over one million foreign nationals. Yeah. As American citizens, every no country on the planet comes remotely close to making yeah. to letting people join their team and have the privileges and protections of our flag and of our government. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. No, no. no I mean, I, the, I mean, I'll always, I mean, America is an amazing country. I mean, um, I've never, I never really understood the whole American culture and everything until I lived there. Uh, and now that I've lived there for eight years um, and it's, it's now I left America a year ago and I'm in the England now and you don't understand how much I miss in, uh, America. I absolutely miss America. I mean, it's just the the conveniency of the country, the the way you guys do things. Uh, well, the way we do things now yeah, that I'm you American, you you know, <laughs> um, it's 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 just amazing. I, I absolutely love that country, and you know, and 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 people always go and they they're trying to tease America. Oh, it's always better and bigger in America. But you know what? 
It is. <laughs> it is bigger and better in America. So you know what? Until you've experienced it, don't shoot it down. Don't shoot it down. You know, and and what I always say to people is the Americans are passionate. They are passionate people about what is close to their heart, you know, and and that's why they might come across as loud and you know, and so but it's not because they're trying to be vain, it's just because they're proud of what's close to and dear to their heart and they they're passionate about it. So they they mustn't take they mustn't take passion for granted and say, and think the passion is is being you know snobbish or being like out out there you know and, and that's why i sometimes get into arguments with um with people talking about america and i'm like don't shoot america until you haven't tried it you know so it's it's i mean i love the country i, I wish i can move back there one day um so fingers crossed i'll hopefully i'll be back in america someday That'd be awesome. I, uh, I have to say that as a child, I lived in 34 of the lo- somebody's phones ringing on your side, I think. <laughs> yeah, just just hold on. It's an alarm. Sorry about oh, this. No, that's okay. South Africans in the audience get the whole point about an alarm. You got to respond to that. You can't ignore that. <laughs> No, I just sorry I just, about that. That's quite all right. I just I just I just uh, told folks I said, hey, uh, South Africans get the whole point about an alarm. You can't ignore an alarm, so you just got to get up and get got to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, in the age of COVID, uh, I, when you got up, I was almost like, okay, I hope he's got shorts on. I hope he's got shorts on. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, it's uh, famously we see journalists, uh, you know, who are sitting at home for major studios, and of course they get up or they've got their boxer shorts yeah. on. It's like, oh god, exactly. Not no. thinking it through. But uh, listen, folks, uh, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adaba Africa Channel. I'm here in Central Pennsylvania. My guest is Andre Salmon, uh, Springbok six three six, now a head rugby coach in the United Kingdom in Doncaster, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, uh, it's a it's a school called Hill House School um, in Doncaster. It's an independent school, um, so it's a co-ed school, boys and girls. Uh, so yeah, it's just outside of Doncaster. So I've got a couple questions I want to bring in, uh, Andre. You can go a bit longer. Yes. We, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yeah, right, no, so, I'm good. Yeah. So we're actually, as I mentioned to you before we went on, we're peaking. We're almost at 100 people watching right now. Which is, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> so, which always happens when you get to the top of the hour. Okay, does my guest continue or do we stop it abruptly? But no, Well, so, hopefully they'll stay. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll stay, exactly. So I've got a few comments from the chat, but I want to get to a few topics you and I were going to discuss. Uh, and that's uh, girls rugby, women's rugby. Yep. And then we'll talk about the Glendale Raptors, if you don't mind. And I no have a question, question about Gary Gold as well. And I, I have a comment and then I'll ask your question. So I'm going to get to those three things. But let me get a couple of things from the chat that people <coughs> ask because, I mean, it's all about the audience. If, if we don't address the things people want to hear about, then they're not going to tune in. So that's what Absolutely. I agree. So Hank Klopper said, uh, listen, um, best coach uh, and captain you ever played under. Who, who, who would you say that was? All right. So my best coach to start off with that would be Nick Mallett. Okay. Um, so the reason why I say Nick Mallett is because he was very consistent. Um, he made you believe that you were the best player in the Jersey. Um, you know, and he was passionate about the game. Uh, he was, I wouldn't say he was the most technical and tactical coach. Um, but the thing is as a player, and I can only speak for myself is I wanted to play for him. I wanted to perform well because he was so passionate about the game and I didn't want to disappoint him. Um, And then obviously myself and then obviously the supporters. So Nick Mallett, hands down, the best coach uh, that I played under. There was a few other coaches as well. uh, Phil Davies, um, Stuart Lancaster um, uh, that I've played under or that's coached me. Um, uh, Eugene van Weyck uh, at the Blue Bulls. Um, as, as also um, was pretty good in, in my early career. Um, so there was a lot of coaches that that's coached me, um, you know, but at the end of the day, people have got to understand rugby is rugby, a catch and a pass and a draw and a pass, a, a tackle. Those techniques will stay with you forever, no matter wh- what kind of coach or who you are. Mm-hmm. I mean, coaching a tackle and coaching people how to catch and pass and how to draw and pass on a 2v1 or a 3v2, those principles stay the same, no matter who you coaches you or no matter what. The difference between a good coach and a bad coach, in my opinion, is 
motivation. Can you motivate the players? Do, do you have the respect of the players? Do you know, do you pay attention to your players and their needs? And the game has changed where nowadays you can't just tell a player, this is how you're going to do it. No, it's becoming more player orientated. You got to understand because at the end of the day, it's them. It's the player that's on the field, not you as a coach, you know? So if the player doesn't want to do it, then he's not going to do it, you know? And if he's going to do it reluctantly, you're probably going to lose the game. So you need to, it's a very fine line between telling him you have to do it this way and, and give him some guidelines. But for me, a, a good coach is a motivator, somebody that can motivate and manage the players. Best captain. Ooh, um, I would, I would probably say Gary Teichman. Mm -hmm. um, Franz Chopina, brilliant person, great captain. I can't say enough of him. Um, unfortunately, I haven't played too many games um, underneath him as my captain. Um, Gary Teichman was, was my captain in my era. Um, brilliant man, once again, great leader. Not a big, loud mouth, rah, rah, rah captain. Got down, said said what he had to say, um, you know, and he had our respect. Um, so, yeah, definitely Gary Teichman. Awesome. Uh, probably Anathal is throwing just different players' names out here in the chat. I guess he's trying to – Jan Ellis, Frick Duprier, Mornay Duplessis, just throwing some names out there. Well, I'm, I am I don't think I was born in that time. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. He's just throwing names out. It's, it's... <laughs> Hey, I mean, whatever. yeah, I mean, if you can, I mean, John Smith was 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 a good captain as well, yeah, yeah. you know, and Nas Buerta was a good captain for the few times that he was a captain. And I mean, you can just go on and on and on. Yeah. But I mean, uh, un unfortunately, I mean, I think uh, for me, those those were the ones that that I'm going to stick with. Yeah, no, it's uh, it also it's not just it's not just the style of play. It's just not the professionalization. It's not just the the uh, the pay and all that stuff, and, and and also the development, physiotherapy, and all those things. It's not just that. It's also the kit. I mean, this thing I'm wearing here, this is brutal. In like you know, in it with Durban, this would be because it's cotton. You know, yeah. now you've got these jerseys that are so thin and they fit so tight, and and they're, they're so. It's uh, even the kit has changed, and, and it, the game has really adapted in the last twenty years. I'd have to say. Would you agree? No, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've, every now and again, I, I'll post a picture of myself on my Facebook page or my Twitter or my LinkedIn account. And people will look at our jerseys and they go like, whoa, bring the cotton back, bring the cotton back. And I'm like, no, you don't want the cotton back. Yeah. It's heavy. Yeah. It's big. Um, I mean, sometimes we get off the field and after a raining game and mud, just the jersey alone weighs about maybe four kilograms you know it's 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 just a heavy piece of clothing you know and it, it just i mean at the time we thought it looks flashy but if you look at the jerseys nowadays they look smart the jerseys really look smart they tight fitting they they're made of material that can stretch and breathe and it's just yeah i mean and that's what the professional era or the professionalism has brought to the game it's it's a business you've you got to run it like a business now well, I can attest 36 years in the Army, marching in the rain, getting muddy. Um, your your clothing definitely gets a lot heavier. It gets heavier. heavy. <laughs> it gets a lot heavier. It gets a lot heavier because we got layers and stuff too. So Croy Thompson it says, uh, what does Andre Stamen think about the new direction of super rugby teams going to Pro 16, which isn't decided yet, by the way. That's still in the works. But Pro 16, I suggested one team go to Premiership. I don't know if England would be up for that, but I think a South African team, either the Bulls or the Stormers in, in Premiership. But anyway, that's just my thoughts. And in your opinion, should they go with the Curry Cup, Champions Cup, League model with Australia, New Zealand, or another option? So what, what do you think is going to happen with the, the death of Super Rugby? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tournament that's been going for so long, um, you know, and I always say don't fix something that's not broken. You know, um, I understand there's probably logistical uh, problems, uh, financial commitments, um, you know, and at, at the end of the day, all I want to see is I just want to see what's best for the players and what's best for their sport um, to, to be able to, for teams to be able to go out there and play in tournaments and leagues and, and, and stuff like that. So it's a tough one. I mean, I think let's leave that for the guys that are in charge of that and let them decide who plays who. Um, you know, all I want to see is just give the players game time, uh, player welfare, don't give them too much time. Uh, uh, they they got to rest as well, so don't kill them by playing every weekend. Um, you know the players they 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 still human beings. They're not robots. Um, so you know I think 
potentially if they want to cut some games out of the super rugby, it's maybe a good thing because then there's less travel, there's less games. Um, you know, the, the players will be well rested uh, and they won't be tired when they play in games. Um, the Bulls or the Sharks or a South African team in the Premiership, logistically, I'm not sure it's going to work, um, especially now with this whole COVID thing. Um, as it is, the the uh, the Cheetahs and the um, Eastern Kings, I think they've they withdrew from the the Pro 14. I mean, they've been basically kicked out of the Pro 14 as already. So it just shows you, you know, they've tried the South African team in the in the Northern Hemisphere League. It worked, but it becomes a logistical nightmare, um, and and it's it must be costly. It must be costly to fly a team over here, keep them in a hotel or in a base for four or five weeks. You know, go back. You got to think about the family time. You know, there's a lot of moving parts with a decision that needs to be made like that. So and that's why I say, I mean, it's 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 a tough one for me to to make a decision on that. I just think, you know, all I have to say, I just care about the player, um, and at the end of the day, we just want to watch rugby. You're right. Now, one of my one of my viewers, uh, Morton Christie, was uh, trapped in Mauritius when the lockdown took place in South Africa, and he took forever to get out because of the way they did repatriation flights. But he's back in South Africa. He went through his two weeks of of, uh, of quarantine, and then they lifted things. But but uh, I think that um, he probably overindulged when they lifted the alcohol ban because he says the sharks the sharks are the Manchester United of rugby. What are you drinking, Morton? It's just, uh, no, come on. Come on, that's that's a bit much. I got I I, I got I got to call BS on that one. Anyway, no. yeah. Uh, so so Jack Sparrow says, listen, Andre, um, which uh, what did you like best in the back line, playing center or wing? Uh, definitely center. Um, okay. Absolutely, that was my best position. Um, Thirteen outside center was my best position, my preferred position as well. Um, it gave me the freedom to to run with the ball, and it gave me the freedom to create something it gave me the ability to to crash the ball off the 12 or with a skip one from the 10 um, it, it just gave me that flexibility to do what I wanted to do on attack um, on defense it did put me under pressure I mean I think probably the most difficult position to defend on a pitch in my opinion is probably the 13 channel uh, nowadays because you've got so many traffic if I mean traffic I mean players running into your channel that you need to defend. Um, you've got the blind winger coming around the corner, especially with the balls that they play today out the back. They play the ball like either to the front player or to the player behind. Um, there's just a lot of people running into your channel that you need to defend. And if you don't make your decision quick and early and you can read the game, you're in trouble. Um, so, yes, de definitely 13. On defense, it kept me on my toes. Um, I was fortunate that I, I had a bit of speed so if I was in a situation to get myself out of the situation on defense, I could do that because I could explode to the left or to the right to make the tackle. Um, wing wing was good. Uh, I enjoyed playing wing, um, but it was very – it, it bound me to my my side of the pitch. Yeah, you know, if I was yeah. a right wing or a left wing, uh, I had to stay there. And, I'm, and, and yes, as a coach, you would like your wingers to – to move around and, and insert into the back line every now and again. But you know what, if you go, if you're a right winger and you go all the way to the left wing and you play on the left wing, you know, if there was a turnover ball, who's going to cover you on the right wing? Mm -hmm. um, then the coach is going to say to you, you were out of position. <laughs> so it, it just, it just restricts you a little bit um, on the wing in terms of positional play. Um, but it also, you know, and especially, the times you get the ball is very limited. Yeah. So if you do get the ball, you got to make good use of it. Where at center, uh, you have a little bit more ball time, so to speak. You get the ball in your hands a little bit more often, um, and it, it just you're all over the pitch. You know, it's the middle of the pitch is yours. You can go wherever, which which I really really enjoyed. So yeah, definitely thirteen was my preferred position. No, that's a great answer. You, you, we were talking a few moments ago uh, about uh, the expansion, or not expansion, but moving from Super Rugby to these other, uh, potentially to Pro 14 or it's all called Pro 16 or even Premiership. But you brought up a topic which I think is critically important, and this has been a challenge with the expansion of professional rugby. It's, it's, it's player welfare, player safety. I mean, I was crushed to see um, Sam Warburton retire. That, that really sucked. I mean, because mm. one of my favorite players, but because of head injuries, he left. 
And then we saw Pat Lambie because of head injuries leave. And then I was actually at the game, I think it was in Birmingham, in the 2015 World Cup when Jean de Villiers uh, had his jaw broken against Samoa. And that was the end of his career. And it's just, it's, it's a shame. And I think some of the contributing factors there, uh, if, you, if you agree or disagree, let me know. But some of the contributing factors there are Curry Cup, Super Rugby, the Springboks test, players in, going up to the Northern Hemisphere playing or going to Japan and playing. And basically, you can play rugby all year round based on the schedule. No, definitely, Chris. I mean, there's, uh, I mean, you basically answered yourself. I mean, there's just so many contributing factors about players retiring early. I mean, let's take injury out of the equation, okay? Um, that's let's take injury out of the equation. I, I honestly believe we all love the game. We all want to watch the game, um, but I do think there's too much rugby. Uh, there's way too much rugby being played, um, and, and that's why the players are breaking down. Um, I remember. When I was a youngster playing, you know, starting playing for the Northern Transvaal, I mean, I think we played like 28 games a season and we thought that's a lot of games. Now they literally play every weekend. It's, it's, it's just amazing. I think the average now must be close to like 40, 40 games a season for a player. That's a lot. And, and the game has become faster. The players are becoming stronger. The hits are bigger. Um, you know, it's it's the the, the whole game has has changed, and and that's why I think a lot of teams they do get the the the, the dynamics right by rotation system. You have to bring in a rotation system where your squad is not just twenty five big. Your squad has to be thirty five big, yeah. and all thirty five players are equally um, adept and good enough to start. And you just got to rotate. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why those Springboks, sorry to say it, won the World Cup. Because if you look at their bench, the bench could have started the game. Oh, I mean, yeah. the, the quality. For any other, any, other, any other rugby nation, we would have happily Correct. taken them on the Eagles, every single one of them. <laughs> exactly. So, so, and I think that is what needs to happen, is the fact that the, the, the squads, if they want to play all year round, the squads has to, they have to get bigger. And, and and start the rota player rotation system um, because you know once again I can only compare it with 12, 15 years ago we had players retire at the age of 35 mm -hmm. 32 I mean myself I retired at 33 um, you know so you had players retiring at a later age mm -hmm. where now they retire at 27 yeah. 28 you know and it's because they've played too much rugby they've burnt out and and that's a sad thing. And then you get the the flip side to the coin is you get kids at the age of 18 started playing international rugby. I mean, that kid will never last until 33. He's not going to last until the age of 33, you know, and, and that's that then that's not even talking about the front row. If he's a, a 18 year old prop or a 18, 19 year old hooker, I can't see him making 28 I, I, with his career. You know, um, unless he's being managed properly. Um, so, yes, it is a concern for me um, watching the kids getting younger and younger playing professionally. Um, I just hope they have the strength and the right gym programs and nutrition and all those things to to help them last as long as they can. But, yeah, the, like, I mean, I, I sound like a stuck record. The game has changed. I yeah. mean, it's, 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 it's unfortunately, it, it, it has changed. It's become a business. It's absolutely become a business. Um, and the players are just basically a pawn in the game. And they, he's, they're just being moved around like a chess game. They're just being moved around. And, and I just hope that the coaches and the unions do take the player welfare into account. Um, you know, but I think to solve the problem is just to make your squads bigger. Uh, and 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 use the player rotation system, which which I know some clubs do. They do do that. Uh, you know, they they will look at this their their fixtures and they say, right, this is an important game. This one is maybe we can potentially lose this game. We'll still be in the running. They need to sit down and plan who they're going to bring in as reserves, rotate, and then and that way you get your player that's maybe a little bit younger mm -hmm. time to get experience. So he doesn't. So he doesn't always sit on the bench. He actually gets game time, and by getting game time, he's gaining experience. So with experience, he could potentially play in the bigger games. So it's it's like a win-win situation. Absolutely. So a few years ago, uh, we were quite excited here in the U.S. because John Mitchell was named to be the Eagles coach, 
And um, no, no comment uh, for or against John. I thought he did a, a pretty bang up job. But uh, one of the challenges, of course, was that um, he tried to live in South Africa and coach the team uh, coming here. Uh, it didn't. I don't know if it worked particularly well, but he did have a winning record. I think he's the first USA head rugby coach that had a winning record in ages nine and eight. But then uh, he left, uh, and um, we got Gary Gold, and we went undefeated in a test season, including beating Scotland. It was quite a season. Now, now our rugby World Cup performance was a little disappointing, but but I I, I think there were reasons for that. But what are your thoughts on Gary Gold and USA rugby? No, I mean it's. I've got mixed emotions um, on that topic, on that question. Uh, I mean, like, like I say, I mean, one of the reasons why I went to America is to get involved in the rugby community, get involved in USA rugby, um, you know. Um, so, unfortunately, it didn't work out. It didn't go that route. Uh, I've never been asked to be part of their training camps. I've never been asked to be part of their... Although I was committed to Glendale, yes, I understand that, but... There's nothing wrong with just asking me to come in for a technical advisor for a few games or something like that. I've never been asked to help. I've never been asked to, and I've offered my services to, to I'm not going to mention names. And, and they just said to me, uh, oh, don't worry, Andre, we've got enough coaches. And I was like, I'm not there to take a position. I'm just here to help. I just want to share my knowledge with you. Um, I'm not here to take, I don't want a position. I don't want a coaching position at USA Rugby because I've got a position, a current position at Glendale. I just here to help. I just want to share my knowledge and, and stuff. But anyway, I don't want to sound like sour grapes, um, but you know what? I think Gary came in um, once again, Gary is a great rugby brain. Um, and, you know, and I think he's made some changes. Um, he's made, once again, I think he made the players believe that they are the best yeah, in their in their position, he hasn't made a lot of uh, substitute, uh, not substitutes. What's the right word? Team selection. Yes. He didn't make a lot of changes. You know, when it, when it, when when it matters, which was good, which uh, which creates confidence in the players. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I want I want to see America succeed. I really honestly want to see them succeed, and, and I think they have the ability and and potentially the players to compete at first nation at the first tier they do um it's just i think they just need to maybe restructure their infrastructure if that makes sense um and get the right people in the right places um you know then potentially it, it will work they will definitely play at a higher level uh once again unfortunately as you know the american players are all scattered all over the country it's a very similar to a namibia situation they scattered all over the country they come, what, two weeks before a t test. They come together. They train for two weeks, and you expect them to perform. Um, no, it's not going to work. They, they need to be able to get these test players together for a longer. I mean, that is why the Sevens program is so successful, because they got the players living at the, at the Olympic Stadium. So they train together 24-7. They're together the whole time. They get to know each other where with the rugby 15s, they scattered all over the country. They come together a week or two before a test and you expect them to perform. It's not going to happen because the way they are being coached at their clubs, it's different than the way they're being coached at the international level or at, at the training camp. And, you know, you got to, it, it takes a while to get out of that, the, the club coaching ethos to get back into a Gary Gold camp. Um, it takes a while to let go of the way you play your rugby at the club. This is the way to play now. Um, so it takes time. And, and, and they don't have that time um, to get those players on the same page before a test. Uh, but, but, I mean, I'm positive. I want to stay positive about American rugby. I think they're on the right track. Uh, but like I say, it's, 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 it's a work in progress. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, Major League Rugby, from, from my perspective, is a great development. Uh, <clears throat> it was in its third season going really well. Um, I don't like a single New York sports franchise. I detest New York sports franchises. <laughs> uh, but but the moment they announced Rooney and um, I started seeing the signings, I became a Rugby United fan and um, I've been with them all the way. I would drive four hours uh, and pay about $50 in tolls to get to a game on Coney Island, and I went to every game last year that they were home, and uh, massive fan. 
so I, I th hopefully Major League Rugby will get us there. We're also getting lots of South Africans coming up and playing here, and not just folks who, who've, who've been, you know, maybe the tail end of the career like Joe Peterson playing for the San Diego Legion, but we're also getting young kids playing. Plus, we've got a number of South Africans uh, whose family came to the U.S., like Hanko Hemeshoys, who's fantastic for the Eagles. Um, so hopefully that will keep developing. And then I have to say, when it comes to sevens, I mean, I no one's going to say anything bad about Mike Friday for me, man. I'll tell you, that guy is awesome. And where our sevens have gone, it's just been absolutely amazing. Last year, every single semifinal in the HSBC Seven Series, the USA, first team to ever do it, tantalizing close to winning the title for the season. We were so close. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I agree with you. And, you know, I mean, he's done an amazing job with the sevens team. You know, he obviously got them on the right path. And uh, he... he, he he gave them something. He came in with 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 something, made them believe in themselves, or his coaching philosophy, or I don't know what he did, but he he, he got the magic potion, and you know they played really really super rugby. From I remember I was involved with a, a little bit of defense when Matt Hawkins was there. Um, I helped him a little bit with the defensive side of the sevens, and then unfortunately um, Matt. Um, got asked to step down um, and then I had to step down my, at the same time. And then Mike came in and, and yeah, I mean, it was great being part of that setup. Um, and then Mike came in and he just turned it around, which was brilliant. Um, so, and it's good to see. And, 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 and that's why I say to you, if the sevens can do it, I'm positive the 15s can do it as well. And I, and I do believe the MLR will definitely benefit um, the players or the players will benefit from the MLR. Sorry. Um, you know, um, I just hope that the MLR is sustainable. Yeah. Um, you know, that is, that is my biggest concern um, is because at the end of the day, the only way, as you know, and most of us know, the only way a club is sustainable is bums in seat. Yeah. Correct. Um, and I don't see bums in seat. I don't see 20, 30,000 people at a stadium. I don't see that. Uh, and that is the only way the, 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 the clubs will sustain. Um, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure whether the, the big punters, the money punters behind the clubs, the owners of the clubs, whether they can have enough financial backing to, to carry the club for two, three, four years until we have enough bums in seats. Um, you know, then it, it, it just, it's a, it's a knock on effect. You ask yourself, why isn't there enough bums in seat? Is it because people in America are not educated about the sport? They don't understand it. They don't know what it is. That's why they don't go there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's such a knock on effect. You can ask yourself a hundred questions. Why, 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 why? Um, but, you know, all I'm saying is it's positive. It's growing. But is it going to grow fast enough to sustain the clubs? I hope so. Um, because I do believe it's a good competition. It's like you say, they bring in all these international players um, that can help the local players uh, lift their standard of play, which is brilliant. Um, you know, so it's, it's, I think the model and the concept is great. Um, at the end of the day, it's like you said, it's, it's just a financial thing. Um, everything, it's, it's about the financials, financial sustainability, you know, um, and I hope they can sustain it. Absolutely. Uh, that's the bottom line with this. And uh, now there's going to be a, a MLR franchise in Hawaii, the first professional sports franchise out there. That's that's yeah. backed by a group of uh, Pacific Islanders who used to play for the All Blacks. Um, of course, I call mm -hmm. that I call that the farm system for for um, the uh, All Blacks. That would be the Pacific Islands. That's what we're always <laughs> yeah. worried about. So. But you see, but 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 I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, it's br brilliant to hear those things. But it's logistically now you got to fly all the way to my, uh, Hawaii. It's a long way. You know, it's 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 a long way. So now you're wasting all that money to fly over there. And uh, could that money not be spent better somewhere else? You know, it's. That's that whole catch twenty two situation about you want to develop things, but how do you develop it and the money issues and it's just yeah, it's it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah, no, for me, I was actually to be honest, a little surprised at Major League Rugby. I guess they must have had some big money behind them, was my supposition when they put teams in New York and Seattle and Texas. I mean, you couldn't get further geographically apart. I thought maybe they concentrate on the East Coast, the Atlantic Seaboard, or maybe in California and and that. But they they're going all out. So I, you know, it's but but I wish them the best. I really want. Oh no, absolutely. I, I 100% can't agree more. I wish them best and I want to see them succeed, um, you know, because I think it will just be it will be beneficial for for the for the sport in America. 
So listen, uh, Andre, uh, there's a, I have a bad habit, so I need I self-regulate and self-check myself. I've had four-hour and 20-minute streams. We're not going to do that to your family today. So, so, <laughs> so fine. you've been very generous with your time. But I, I wanted to um, get back to something you mentioned earlier because um, this is something that touched a lot of people. It was really sad to see. It was unfortunate to see it happen. But, but I'm going to ask you about this, and then um, and, and unless you, you, you want to stay much longer, then I'll ask you for final thoughts or things you'd like to share. But before we get there, I haven't really asked you about girls rugby and your coaching. Do you want to stay and talk about that, or do you want to save that for a future conversation? No, let's let's talk about it. It's okay. uh, it's it's something that's very close to my heart, so I'm I'm happy to talk even five hours about it. Okay. Well, well, this I want <laughs> as to long ask... as as long as I don't as long as I don't bore you. <laughs> no, I'm bored. No, I'm not bored at all. Trust me. Trust me. Uh, it's uh, listen. I, I if I can if I can stay engaged and enthralled by a conversation with a guy that spent 17 years as a panel beater then clearly I can listen. And, Good. <laughs> and I love, and rugby, rugby is one of my first loves. So, so look, I mean, I don't mean to bring up a, a, a difficult thing. I imagine it's not the easiest because you were roommates for so long. You were teammates. But when Josef van der Westhuizen passed away, it touched so many people all over the world. I mean, people, yeah. not just in rugby nations, but people had heard his name. They, I mean, maybe because it's an interesting name if you're not an Afrikaans speaker, but but also because he was such a great rugby talent and a fascinating celebrity, I guess, because he was a celebrity. Um, so, you knew him probably professionally longer than most people. And, uh, and what was he like? I mean, as a person, I mean, it was, was, was he the celebrity? Was he an interesting guy? He was a very interesting person. Um, to be fair. Um, he was a kind of guy, um, very family driven. Um, he loved his family. Um, he, he, he absolutely, it was to him, it was all about his mom and his dad and his two brothers. Um, uh, you know, and I think, the fact that rugby, and he was a brilliant rugby player. Let's let's you know we don't have to talk about that. I mean we all know that. Um, and I think the fact that the professional game has basically interfered with his private life in terms of time that he wants to spend with his family and time that he wants to spend with his mates, the in, the professional li um, lifestyle has taken that away from him because he had to do photo shoots and he had to do uh, interviews and he, and, and, and he became a celebrity. Uh, and, and, and I think he, I don't want to use the word hate that. I think he struggled to, to, to control that because he wanted to be with his family and he wanted to be with his friends and he wanted to do what he wanted to, but he couldn't because he always was dragged away by fame and by, by interviews and all that stuff. So eventually he started adopting this attitude whenever he's in the public eye, when you meet him, he'll come across as snobbish. He'll come across as cold, um, as not interested, um, stuck up, all those negative words. And the reason why he did that was is to blow the people off and, and basically show them, I'm not interested. You know, uh, and, and that's why, unfortunately, the people got this perception about him being stuck up and, and all that stuff. Their first impressions when they meet him is because in the back of his mind, he goes, oh, here we go again. Here we go again, you know, and he'd rather be somewhere else. But if you get him on a Sunday morning after a game at his house and, uh, and, and at a lunchtime barbecue or something like that, he is the nicest man down to earth funny he is so funny i mean he's really a funny man he entertains he laughs and because that is him that is who he is uh, but unfortunately in the public eye he had to change he had to put this visage on and and it was sad to see that as a friend you know how different he is at his home or at our houses when we have a barbecue at my place and how he acted in the public with supporters and media and stuff like that. Just two completely different people. Um, and I respected him for that. And, and, you know, and I couldn't hold it against him. Um, I, I had, there was a few times where I would feel the same, where I got dragged away from my family because of media commitments and stuff like that as a professional rugby player. And I understood why he felt the way he felt and why he would pretend to be this not approachable person. I'm not approachable. Stay away from me, um, you know. Um, but you know, it, it's it's just sad to to you know he's gone. He's not here with us anymore, um, you know. But the interesting thing is just to to start talking about this not so nice topic. You know, you know, you look at James Small. James Small is the same. Unfortunately, he passed away. Chester Williams, you know, uh, he passed away. Jonah Loma, 
he's passed away. There's some serious big names that's, that's unfortunately not with us anymore. You know, and all those players, they, they were phenomenal. And, and it's just sad to, to see them, you know, die and pass away. Um, you know, but uh, it's, it's just memories. You, we create memories with them and uh, we just hold on to that. Well, that 95 uh, World Cup winning team has been jinxed, as some people say, oh, with uh, so many players yeah, passing away absolutely. prematurely. Uh, yeah, yeah, you mentioned Jonah Lomu, um, obviously not Springbok, but uh, someone asked about Jonah Lomu earlier. Did you, did you play against him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We've played a few times against him. You know, he's a, like I say, he's a beast on the field. Um, very, very, he's a phenomenal player with ball in hand. You know, it was just unbelievable. But once again, off the pitch, such a humble person, very humble. You know, he'll come to you and he'll shake your hand, and it's it's like you'll you like he'll be very humble and drink a beer with you and stuff like that. It's just yeah, it's just amazing how sometimes the public will see these icon players in it in the group as not approachable. But once you get to know them and you get to know the real player behind the jersey, you know, they actually. They're just humans. They're just, just like us. They, they're just normal people with a talent to play rugby. Well, while we're talking, uh, Andre Jacobs, who's uh, in uh, China, he actually works in China, uh, said that uh, Nick Bester has been attacked again. Um, he's 60 now. And I've seen, I just looked it up to make sure it was actually happening. Uh, he was uh, riding, I guess, in the Mahalisberg. And um, he looks pretty, pretty, he's in hospital. He's beaten up pretty badly. Um, this is just, Horrific. I mean, he's the 1991 uh, Comrades champion. I mean, I, that's a race I once thought I wanted to run. You're from no. K, you're from KZN, so you're probably like, were you crazy? No. Because I'm like, it's an ultra marathon. It sounds cool. And and when I thought about it, Andre, I said, you know what? I want to run from Peter Maritzburg down to the ocean. And I talked to people who did the Comrades, like, no, no, think about that. You don't want to do that. And I thought about it. I said, you know what? It's all downhill mostly, so that'd be rough on your tendons and your joints. And they said, exactly right. The best way to run it is from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. But you know what I decided in the end? The best way to run it is to watch it on television. Oh, no. Chris, <laughs> my, my philosophy in life is why run if nobody is chasing you? <laughs> Well, well, listen, Andre, that kind of goes along with my, cause that goes along with my philosophy about jumping out of planes. I was in the army for 36 and a half years and, and I don't understand why people jump out of perfectly good planes. Uh, that parachutes only for an emergency in my view. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, 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 no. I, I, there's no way I only run when somebody chases me. That's it. <laughs> uh, yikes. Hey, well, well, thanks. Thanks for sharing those, those insights about you because I mean, a yeah. lot of people didn't get to see that part of him. They just saw yeah. the celebrity and over time, I, I, I it, if you disagree, let me know. But I, it, it, not nothing about Yust, but but the celebrity became kind of caustic, and a lot of people yeah. didn't like the celebrity of Yust van der Westhuizen. Yeah. But that wasn't I mean, who and, the guy I, was. No, no. Unfortunately, like I say, I mean, he, he 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 was not the he was not this cleanest person out there. He had a history. Yeah. He had some skeletons in his cupboard. We all do, yeah. um, you know. And unfortunately, the media got a hold of that uh, and they pulled it apart. Um, you know, and he's there was there was really some tough times for him, um, you know, with his with with what he's done in his life uh, and stuff. And but I think he he took a, accountability for it. Um, you know, he had the courage of his convictions. Um, you know, uh, it's 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 just sad to see that the media actually brought out the the ugly, the ugly and the and the player. Um, and and it's that old saying, you know, nobody forgets when I do something wrong, and nobody remembers when I do something right. Um, so unfortunately, that's what happened with him. Um, they only remember the the bad stuff that he did, but they forget uh, the good stuff he did. You know, behind the scene, going to the hospital and working with kids with cancer. Um, you know, donating funds to to kids with underprivileged and buying food for underprivileged uh, people on the street, buying bread rolls and stuff. Nobody sees that. Nobody saw that about you. You know, the, the good work that he did behind the scenes, they all just see the ugly stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's why I want to ask you about it, because you get some insight because you knew the guy and yeah. uh, the rest of us didn't get to know him that way. We just got to see him and see him play and see the celebrity. So thanks a lot for it. Bye. 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 Dr. No worries. Appreciate Pleasure. That. Okay, so so let me shift a little bit here. Now, um, we were talking. You were saying earlier that the sevens program may be folded in England, and maybe I won't get to see Dan Norton anymore. That's just crazy. Wales is folding their program, uh, and that just begs the question: What about women's rugby, girls' rugby? Because that's uh, that's something that's often, in my view, neglected by world rugby. It doesn't give the attention it needs to. And I see them. You don't have to comment on this. This is Chris commenting here. So, but if you want to, you can. But it's it's. I look at world rugby, and and um, well, I've met Mr. Bill or Sir Bill Beaumont, and um, and I have respect for the organization. I get a little frustrated. 
because they, they they do things that I consider virtue signaling. Like, you know, they, they decided not to call it the Women's Rugby World Cup anymore. And I, I didn't like that. And I thought that was egalitarian. So now we have a Rugby World Cup every two years. Huh? What's that all about? But th th that to me doesn't accomplish anything. What accomplishes things for women is finding ways to grow the sport, get it on television, yeah. get bums in the seats, as you say, and make it so that women can make money off the sport. Um, and now if they're cutting sevens, what's going to happen to women's programs is my concern. Now, the reason I mention this is because you coach boys and girls, correct? Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, and just to, to, to your point, you know, I mean, uh, funny enough, I mean, rugby is in our family. Um, my wife, Philippa, was sitting this morning. We were talking and just she said to me, I, Andre, did you see that women's sport, women's rugby has grown by 30 percent? Um, you know, across the world, um, which is positive, um, which is, and, and that is brilliant. Um, so, and that is why, and I said earlier before we started this, you know, women's rugby is quite close to my heart because of my daughter. Um, you know, she's coming, she's only 12 years old, but I, I, I do believe that she's got a future and, and I would like to be part of that. And if I can make that future happen for her, I'll do anything I can. Um, but Women's sport is, is especially rugby, it, it has to grow. It must grow because there's so many girls out there that that loves the game and they want to play. Yes, football, a lot of girls are playing football um, all over the world. It's not as contact as rugby, but you'll be surprised. Some of these girls, they love the contact. They are like sponges. They, they soak up the energy. They soak up the knowledge um, because they... They don't know anything else. They've never played this game. So at the age of 13 or 15, you know, they've, they've never played rugby. So they like a dry, can like a blank canvas. And all they want to do is play rugby. And they actually enjoy the contact for funny enough, you know, and they, they really enjoy like, like running into people and stuff. Some of them are a bit squeamish, you know, but once you teach them the right technique and, and you under explain to them what to do, you know, they just they just absolutely enjoy it. And and I do believe that there's there's a big future for, for women's rugby. I mean, if you look at some of the premiership clubs here in the UK, they all most of them have a women's program as well. Um, it, it's just sad that some of the programs don't get the same funding as the men's programs. Uh, once again, I understand why, because it's just a lot of uh, maybe, I don't know what's the right word, tradition. You know, people would say, oh, no, women shouldn't play rugby. It's a man's game. It's a man's game. Women shouldn't play rugby. Uh, no, I mean, why not? Um, women are equal as men. They can do exactly the same as us, um, you know. So there shouldn't be that discrimination about, oh, no, it's just a men's game or, or something like that. I don't think that's right. I think it's rather let's develop them they might be at a different level, whether that level is higher or lower than the men, we don't know. I'm just saying that you can't expect women to be at the same level as men, um, you know, because men has played the game longer. But I think each entity in their own right is, is, is brilliant. Um, so, you know, if you look at the, the, the quality of the rugby that they play at international level, you know, England, Ireland, uh, New Zealand, Australia, if you look at those women's teams and you look at the sevens, even 15s, you know, the quality of those games are, are just as good as the, as the men, you know, is they might be two steps slower than the men because that's just genetics, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take anything away from them being good. Um, so yes, I would love to, and it's my goal to develop women's rugby. Um, I've developed the program at the school, um, when I got to the school, there was only two girls playing rugby, which was my daughter and another girl in year 11. Um, and within three months, we had 45 girls playing rugby. Wow. So, so yes. And, and it's just making the game enjoyable. Let, show them that it's safe. Um, let them enjoy it play play games let them interact with each other and sh uh, and they just like i said i can't wait to go back to school and and start over again um and hopefully you know get a, a program that where more and more girls will will get involved at the school uh, and then eventually i would like to go to a club level there are already at club levels there are some uh, girls uh, programs but i want to get involved in the coaching side of things and help the coaches 
coach. I don't want to take their jobs. Once again, I'm not there to take their positions. I'm just there to share my knowledge and share them, maybe do things slightly different, maybe look at this, try this. Uh, that's my goal. And then ultimately, I would like my, my daughter and maybe my son to, to head back to the U.S. Uh, and go and play at a college there because they, they, they won't take up a foreign spot because they're American. So, uh, so I would like to let them go back to America and play for a college there and then ultimately get involved there as well. So that's why, fingers crossed, I, can, I would like to go back to America one day and start, start a woman pro, women's program there. Um, I've been thinking about trying to find ways and talk to companies uh, to start a, a girls program or an academy uh, somewhere in America, purely just for girls. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Rhino Academy. Yes. There's okay. Uh, there's a, the Rhinos Academy. There's the Tiger Tiger Rugby Academy. Um, so there's all these academies, and yes, there are girls involved in some of those academies. But I want to try and put up an academy purely just for women, mm -hmm. just for girls, um, and it's just to try and find that right company, uh, that right person to click with. And where that will back me and say, right, Andre, you know what? We'll back you. Let's do this. Um, because people are still a little bit skeptical about women's rugby. Um, and I just got to show them that there's a future. And hopefully I can get people behind me and we can do that. Um, so it's, it's a work in progress, bit of a pie in the sky. Uh, but yes, girls rugby is very close to my heart. Um, and I'll, that's like I said, it's, it's purely for my daughter. And if I can create a pathway for my daughter... Um, and other goals, I would love to do that. No, it's brilliant. I was just sitting here, Andre, while you were talking, sketching some notes of things that why why I love rugby, uh, and, and especially why it's I think it's important for girls to get into it. You know, I talk to South Africans and I talk about rugby. I talk about girls rugby, and they say to me, "Girls don't play rugby." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they do. That's they the, do. that's the first reaction. That's they, the first reaction. They exactly. do. And the fact that you don't know that. I mean, listen, if you've never watched women play rugby, um, all you have to do is watch Mogley Harvey's try in the 2014 Women's World Cup in Paris at Jean Buen Stadium. I was there. Yeah. All. My God, the best try I've ever seen in my entire life. Amazing. It's a shame she's been she got injured after that and then dropped from the team in Canada. But she was unbelievable, and and, mm. and she is she was as, as fast as anybody except maybe Perry Baker and Carlin Isles yeah. in the sevens. But yeah, but some of the words I've put I put down here. Oh, okay, good, good. But the other thing is, Chris. I mean, I mean, I've got this this girl that that started at the school. She's never played, and she and she she actually wrote me a personal note when she's finished, and she's she said that coach. I could never find a sport that I like. I tried hockey and I couldn't enjoy that. I tried netball. I didn't enjoy that. The minute I started playing rugby, I absolutely fell in love and I found a sport that I, where I belong. That was her words. I found a sport where I belong. And, and I just looked at it and I was like, you know what? That is what's creating it. It's another sport where girls can belong to something. And the beauty about rugby is like we all know, there's different positions for different body shapes. Exactly. You don't have to be six foot four to play volleyball. You know, if, you, if you're not six foot four, six foot seven, you're not going to play volleyball or basketball. You know, with rugby, it's not like that. Whether you're short, tall, whether you, it doesn't matter what body shape you are or ability, there's a position for you in the team. And that is, and, and the other thing is with rugby that I really, really like is everybody interacts with everybody. Everybody can score. You know, it's not just one person that scores the whole time. You know, um, it's not just center forward or it's not just the quarterback or the wide receivers. It's everybody can score. Everybody can run with the ball. Yep. Everybody, everybody feels like they contribute to the team's performance. And, and, and that to me is important for girls. And girls love that because girls love to, you know, be part of something and interact with each other. And, you know, there's no, not a lot of egos. Like with the boys, there's, there's egos. There's a bit of like, hey, look at my muscles and there's too much testosterone and all that stuff. Where with the girls, it's not like that. It's a completely different person you're dealing with. It's, it's, it's a person that wants to, it's all about teamwork mm -hmm. and let's just do this together. And, you know, they're there for each other. They support each other. It, it's, just, it's just so nice to see. No, absolutely. And, you, and that's the other thing I love about rugby, too. I mean, not, not just girls, but guys, too. But is that, I mean, you can have so many different body types in play. I mean, everyone thinks that you got to be this big guy with no. color flower ears, you know. No, 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 no. No, you no, don't no. have to uh -huh. be. I mean, look, look, I mean, you've got Cheslin Colby and you've got yeah. Lutiaga on the same team. Talk about 
polar opposites of physical appearance Correct. and both make amazing contributions to the team. Cheslin Colby, oh, what a dynamo. That guy. And, oh, you, no. and people are like, okay, he's fast. Yeah, but have you seen him hit? Oh my God, he can yeah. take guys out. It's I mean, amazing. I think, I mean, pound for pound, he's, he's, I think he's, he's, he punched way above his body weight. But the words I was looking at, and you've touched on a little bit there. So when I think about rugby and athletic girls, it's a great mechanism a vehicle for building self-esteem which is especially important for young teen girls which deal with all kinds of beauty and appearance issues which are nonsense yeah. but that's that's just how kids grow up that's a reality we have to realize so self-esteem comradeship not not in the soviet communist style but <laughs> camaraderie <laughs> uh, teamwork respect self-respect all of these things they're all things that yeah. kids get out of rugby and that alone and also there's a lot of players on the pitch so a lot of people can get an opportunity to get out there and get on plus you can rotate players around it's uh yeah. much better than a game like soccer in my view no no absolutely i mean I, we, I think we've touched on all of that you know it's, it's like i said it's a team sport you know it, everybody's involved uh, everybody's got to pull their weight you know it's it's not like soccer where the goalie and or the defender just stand at the back and just wait for the ball to come to them no with rugby you got to be there every second you got to make a decision every second you got to be there to support the player next to you it's it's a team it's a sport where you involve the whole time you're you you're involved you're making decisions you got to help you rely on each other the whole time there's there's not a lot of time where you just stand there and wait for something to happen no yeah so listen, I, I'm going to do this, Andrea, because uh, you've been incredibly generous with time. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go beyond two hours because we're coming up on two hours. And not just, <laughs> no, because, thanks, Chris. not just because I want a sandwich. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but seriously, uh, so uh, I'm going to invite you back uh, and, and ask Thank you to come back at an open invitation. We can talk about these topics or something you want to focus on more about rugby. Yeah. We can keep it to a shorter conversation so it doesn't eat up all your time and your family doesn't feel left out. But, but before I go, someone asked a question about, uh, and I'm going to give you a chance to wrap up here before we wrap up. Uh, no worries about Sean von Rendsburg. Um, I guess uh, was was he someone involved in you moving to the states? I don't I don't know who that is. Yes, so Sean von Rendsburg, his nickname was Busty. Okay. Um, the way I got into involved, he's pretty much the main reason why I got involved in coaching. Um, so when I retired in two thousand and seven, I went back to South Africa uh, to start a family and settle down, um, get into construction, uh, uh, being a project manager. Uh, and a quantity controller, uh, a quality controller. Um, I thought, you know, that is my future. That's where I'm heading. That's what I'm going to be doing um, my afterlife, after rugby. Um, and Sean von Rensburg and myself, we were having a, uh, a barbecue at my place, a braai, as we would say in South well, Africa. I, no, I've got to interrupt you real quick because a couple of <laughs> said, wait a second, that doesn't, that, that can't be real. A rugby player <laughs> saying a barbecue? Well, yeah, he, well, we, he's got an American passport now. So I'm like the only <laughs> American that says braai. So anyway, you're, you're allowed. Yeah, so we had a, so we had a braai and um, we were just sitting there talking and, um, and then he just, out of the blue, he just said to me, Andre, you're being selfish. And I said, hang on a second. Why do you say that? You know, I, I sort of almost got offended by that. Uh, and he says, you've played this game for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, why are you not sharing your knowledge and experience with, with players? And, and, and why don't you coach? Um, and I thought about it and I said, oh, okay, he's got a point. Um, and then, you know, thought about it a couple of days and discussed it with uh, Philippa and everything. And then eventually I thought, you know what, let me try it. Why don't I've got nothing to lose. I've got nothing to lose. I went to the local um, the club that I was associated with um, and I said, hey, do you guys mind if I just come and have a look and see what you guys do? And he's like, yeah, no, sure. And, and then eventually I was like, okay, hang on. And then I started seeing things that, that I could change. I started seeing things that I could improve on. Um, uh, and, and I was like, okay, hang on a second. I, I come from a point of view where I can tell them how to do it because I've been there, I've done it, I know it works instead of them trying over and over and over and over and not getting it right, let me give them the tool or give them the, the right way and let them do it the right way from get go and not trying to figure it out. Uh, and, and that's how I got into coaching. Um, and then obviously one thing led to another, led to another. I got this opportunity in America um, to go and coach there. Um, and yeah, and now I'm hooked on coaching. I'm absolutely hooked on coaching. Um, so that's how I got involved involved in coaching. A couple quick questions before we do a wrap up from the chat to get these, and then I'm 
Um, uh, Flock Silliers, uh, he's really into kicking. Uh, is he going to yes. be good? Is he going to be a good interview if I get him on? <laughs> I think he will be. He's quite a character. I That's think Flocky is a is is a he's a good character. He's got some uh, interesting stories. Um, yeah, no, Flocky and I we 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 played against each other. He's now a kicking coach. Uh, he's worked with the French team as well. So uh, I think there's going to be some really interesting uh, questions, or um, it could be an interesting uh, conversation that you could have with him. Definitely. Excellent. I'll, then I'll then I'll pursue that. Uh, so quick questions, and then and then we'll get to the end here. Is uh, Brett asked a question about Do you have a favorite U.S. state? And then before you answer that, um, Lynn asked um, if you miss Africa. Um, I'll always be in my heart, Africa. Um, I'm proudly South African. Um, so. Yes, I'll always be Africa. Um, so uh, to answer that question, I can't elaborate on that. I mean, I was born there and it will always be my home. Favorite state in America? Um, I've been to about 37 states. I would probably say God's country, Colorado. I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, Colorado is, I mean, uh, it's just unbelievable. I love Colorado. It's just, it's an amazing state. Well, interesting enough, one of my favorite places in the States is right next door, just above it in Wyoming. Uh, same sort of situation. Yeah. And I'll actually be out there uh, at 12,600 feet, 8,000 meters here in about a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I must say Montana. Montana comes close. I yeah. mean, Montana is beautiful. Um, and then probably Alabama. For some, I uh, just enjoy Alabama as well. Alabama? Yeah. <laughs> Where'd that come I from? I love Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the people there, man. They're they funny. They entertain me. They, they're characters. I just love the... the the, the difference that it's they they just different I, I just love them okay well, well we'll save that for another conversation and uh maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go in, in a future conversation uh, to get you back yeah absolutely about... just uh let yes. me know maybe a couple of months down the line we can have a conversation again absolutely but i'd like to talk about your experience with the glendale raptors and people learn a little about glendale and, and, and rugby town usa all that going on out there so that'd be cool uh, so let me let me, let me give you this chance, Andre. Um, so anything you want to talk about a topic we haven't raised or just, you know, wrap up with? Um, I just want to say to the people out there, thanks for supporting me, um, the followers. Uh, I've got obviously a, a Facebook page. I've got a Twitter page. I've got a, um, a LinkedIn page, you know, connect with me. Let's have a chat. Um, it's as long as it's all about rugby. I'm happy, happy to talk about that. Um, just Everybody out there, just stay safe. You love each other. Love your family and um, keep up the good work. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Andre Seaman. Bye, bye, donkey. It was really a pleasure. Having... Uh, <laughs> excellent. Uh, <laughs> it was a pleasure having you on. Yeah, pleasure. My, my pleasure yeah. to have you on as a guest today. Uh, I'm going to put you in the waiting room. If you can hang around just for a minute, if you can yeah. indulge me, because I want to just wrap up after golf air, but I'm going to take you Sounds off. Good. All right, folks, that's uh, Andre Seaman. He's been my guest today talking about rugby, some interesting stuff. Andre, we'll catch you a little bit later on. Well, here's, where's that? Sorry. Participants. There we go. All right. Cool beans. I'll put him in the waiting room. All right, so folks, I got to adjust the screen really quick because we get that goofy thing here. There we go. All right, I'm back. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Brett, for the super chats. Thank you all for the questions. They were awesome. Uh, this was a fantastic interview, uh, my first with a spring buck, um, and it was a really good one. Andre is a smart guy. He's got his act together, and he's also kind of the bridge between the amateur era of rugby and the professional era of, as he bridged both of those and quite an interesting transition he's played with some of the giants of the game and against the giants of the game you heard jonah lomo he's played with john smith he's played with uh, uh he was a roommate of Jus van der westhuisen for a long time and a teammate um quite an interesting guy and knows a lot about it 38 caps as a springbok also played for the <coughs> sharks no i'm just kidding and played for the bulls as well Anyway, folks, thank my many thanks, my many, many thanks to Andre. It was a fantastic interview. Um, because of his scheduling, we had to wait. You guys don't know this, but we've been waiting about six weeks to get this to happen, and I'm glad it was well worth the wait. What I'll do is I'll break the interview up later on, edit it, some of the sections where he talks about, like, girls' rugby and the game that girls play and things like that, and do some video shorts so people can watch those as well. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I'll be back later today for the Night Owls edition of 